Now declare that the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session, that all council members are present. We'll begin with item one. Our first item is uh, preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting in executive session. The item to appoint a Heritage Commission interim member has been tabled and uh, we will uh, make that appointment at a later date. Item two, personnel reappointment council. Uh, Plano Health Facilities Development Corporation, which is uh, Casey Prince. And I'd like to uh, reappoint uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince. Do we need a vote for that? Okay. All in favor? Uh, I need a second for that. Excuse second me. the motion. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a motion and a second to uh, reappoint uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes. The second item, uh, item B, Plano Improvement Corporation, uh, would be Jack Carr. We would like to reappoint uh, Deputy uh, City Manager Jack Carr. Do I have a motion and a second? I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. 
All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next item is consideration of a 2022 council meeting uh, council meeting dates. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I have forwarded you a memorandum with proposed meeting dates for uh, the next uh, fiscal year, including. here in Plano to make sure that we can meet when all of our citizens can meet. So with that, we would be uh, adjusting Monday, September 26th to Wednesday, September 28th, and Monday, uh, December 26th, we would meet on Tuesday, December 6th. With those adjustments, we think we can accommodate every other council meeting according to the normal schedule uh, and think we can uh, avoid any conflicts with uh, religious holidays. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is Wednesday, September 28th, the only option to reschedule that one? Wednesdays are just really a challenge. No, they're not. We could actually okay. uh, look for a different date if that would, uh, if that would be more accommodating. <clears throat> and I, I was not going to mention anything, but that's actually uh, Benjamin's birthday. So, uh, so yeah, a different, uh, if that works for others as well, might be, might be uh, very welcome. So. Okay. So bring back a, uh, an alternative for the uh, Monday, September 26th date, uh, but the, t the Tuesday, uh, December 6th would be okay, is what I'm hearing from Council. Hey, Mark. Yes, yes oh. Councilman. Uh, I may have a conflict. I may be out of town the week of the 11th, uh, which might not be a big deal. I could probably have access you know, to do Zoom, but... If there was an alternate date uh, for that, that would be uh, that would be fine with me also. <coughs> for September, Councilman. Uh, for yeah, for se <coughs> September twelfth. Okay, I'll make note of that as well. So we'll bring back a, an alternate date for the uh, the September twenty eighth uh, suggestion, and we'll bring that back at your next council meeting. But we'll consider the December uh, meeting moved, and uh, we'll bring that back and we'll find a, a new date for September. So thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next item is uh, item number four, uh, Plano Housing Authority. Uh, we are uh, going to move that to a later date, uh, sometime uh, in either the next meeting or, the, or thereafter. So we'll move on to item five, uh, the North Texas Municipal Water District Operation Overview. <clears throat> I'm Jerry Cosgrove, of Director of Public Works for the City of Plano. I am not a district employee. But the district is an important partner with the City of Plano. They provide water, wastewater, and solid waste services to us. And basically, Jenna Covington, the new Executive Director, will be talking more on the wastewater side tonight, and specifically about the Rowlett Creek uh, wastewater treatment plant, and that's an integral part of the service that is provided to the city of Plano for wastewater service. Plano generates about 27 to 28 million gallons a day of wastewater. The Rowett Creek has a capacity of treating 24, but on a normal day it treats 19 million gallons, and then pumps about 6 million gallons of that to the Wilson Creek for treatment. We are not the only customer that uses the Rowett Creek. The city of Richardson also uses that plant. And North Texas owns and operates the Rowlett Creek plant. Well, we used to own it many years ago. We built the original plant, and then the district took it over in the 70s, has been operating it ever since. If we still own the plant, we would have to expand the plant or find another place because the plant does not have enough capacity to serve the city of Plano. And with that, I'll be uh, glad to turn it over to Jenna Covington. And at the end, if you have any questions for me or Jenna, we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mayor and Council and Mark, for the opportunity to be with you all today. Let's see. Is it live? All 
All right. Very good. Appreciate the help. All right, so I'm, I'm here to talk with you all about the Rowlett Creek Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, this is not a new topic for the Plano City Council as I've kind of gone back and looked over historical information. Uh, pre predecessors of mine have stood in the same place and, and talked with council about this in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, as the times have changed, uh, some of the dialogue has changed in that during that time, it was really looking at expanding the plant to provide for the growth of of the city of Plano during that time frame. Today, we're more in a position of trying to provide for aging infrastructure. And there's a number of different components associated with aging infrastructure that are driving the needs of today. Uh, one being the operations building there is uh, no longer adequate and safe for our staff. Two being that there's aging infrastructure throughout uh, our systems in terms of how we collect wastewater and bring it to the city, uh, treatment plant for treatment uh, in that we have additional peak flows that are coming during wet weather events. Uh, and three, our solids processing needs improvement. So the, the dialogue uh, is similar, uh, but has changed over time. Uh, prior to getting into the details of the Rowlett Creek facility, just wanted to mention that we are honored, uh, North Texas Municipal Water District is honored to serve the city of Plano as a member city of our water, wastewater, and solid waste systems. We're a regional wholesale provider providing service to you all in all three of these systems. And uh, for the sake of time, we'll spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but uh, thank you all for giving us the opportunity to serve uh, you and your citizens. Uh, as we talk about the mission of the organization, our mission is to provide high quality and dependable water, wastewater, and solid waste services in a cost-effective manner. Uh, the photos on the slide before you uh, represent the one on the left is the tw represents the 27 full-time employees that provide service to Plano there at the Rowlett Creek plant. Uh, the one in the middle is a colleague and I were able to spend the day operating out at Rowlett Creek and you can see what our finished water looks like, the clean water being discharged into the creek compared to uh, the wastewater as it enters the facility. And the picture on the right is actually Rowlett Creek uh, at the place where we discharge clean water into the environment. Uh, we've got 27 committed folks who have committed their careers to protecting public health, enhancing the water environment, and enabling the economic development of the communities that we serve. And they know that we have to be a good neighbor in order to do this well. Uh, the wastewater treatment process that is at Rowlett Creek and the other uh, plants that we've got throughout the service area is a complex engineered process that uses a number of different technologies to take wastewater and produce clean water. Uh, we use physical means, chemical means, and biological means to make this happen. And it begins uh, in the collection system for the pipes that run through uh, our communities uh, and then transfer flow to the plant. And then at the back end of the plant, there is testing to ensure that what's being discharged into the environment is uh, satisfactory to meet uh, the needs of our communities. Uh, throughout that process, we also have incorporated odor control uh, in order to ensure that uh, we are being good neighbors. Uh, specifically looking at the Rowlett Creek Wastewater Plants Service Area, uh, this map kind of depicts the area's uh, wastewater treatment plants which we operate. Uh, the gray outline represents the city of Plano. You all have 200, or estimated 287,000 uh, residents. And of those, uh, Rowlett Creek uh, serves about a total population of 186,000. It does also pick up portions of the city of Richardson. And so the Plano population served by this facility is 148,000. Uh, and then the remaining Plano population is served by our Wilson Creek plant uh, to the north that is located in the Lucas area. The Rowlett Creek plant was originally constructed in 1956 by the city of Plano. Uh, and the city of Plano operated it for uh, about 19 years until uh, at the request of our member cities, uh, the city of Plano specifically, uh, that plant was actually turned over to North Texas Municipal Water District to resume operation or to take over operation in 1975. 
Uh, as depicted in the uh, graphic below, there were a series of expansions to the Rowlett Creek plant capacity uh, during the 80s and the 90s, uh, with the most recent expansion occurring in year 2000 when it was expanded to 24 million gallons per day, and we have no plans to expand beyond 24 million gallons per day. As you can see in the graphic below, it also lists the Wilson Creek Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, which began operation in the mid 80s and is now expanded up to 64 million gallons per day with no plans for future expansion. And the Sister Creek Regional Water Resource Recovery that's currently under construction for its initial 16 MGD capacity to be then expanded beyond that to sustain the growth of the service area. Uh, as Mr. Crossgrove mentioned, uh, with no plans to further expand Rowlett Creek beyond its current 24 million gallon per day capacity, we must have daily transfers to Wilson Creek in order to provide reliable service to the city of Plano. On average, around 25 million gallons per day is arriving at the Rowlett Creek site, and around 19 million gallons per day is actually be tr being treated there at the site, and an additional six is being transferred up to the Wilson Creek site. Uh, there have been some individuals that have suggested that we should decommission the Rowlett Creek wastewater treatment plant. And so to help you all kind of understand the context of that conversation, uh, this is a map that kind of gives you some information to understand uh, the cost magnitude that we would be considering if that was ever to be considered. Uh, the Rowlett Creek wastewater plant is on the bottom. As you can see, uh, Wilson Creek is to the middle and up uh, to the right. And then Sister Grove is where all additional capacity in this area is being provided for as the area continues to grow. Uh, we currently are in, the, in construction to begin the Sister Grove Regional Facility. And the first 32 million gallons per day of capacity up at Sister Grove is $546.6 million. So that's to provide for the treatment capacity. Uh, if you recall, Rowlett Creek is around 24, so around two thirds of that capacity. So the, just purely the replacement of that treatment capacity is of substantial cost. In addition to the treatment capacity and the costs associated with that, you also have to get the wastewater to the location. And in the case of Sister Grove, the intent is to pick up flows from McKinney, which is in close proximity uh, to that site and transfer those flows from the McKinney area up to the Sister Grove facility. In order to facilitate those transfers for that initial uh, 32 million gallon per day capacity, it's costing $154 million uh, to construct all the projects associated with it. With that said, that's not going very far uphill. Uh, when you think about the topographic constraints of where Rowlett Creek is relative to Sister Grove, uh, it's 16 miles uphill, uh, which is much more substantial in terms of complexity and cost in order to convey those flows. Additionally, we would need to build pipelines through uh, areas that are built out within your community, which would be quite disruptive uh, to the citizens that would be along that route. Uh, there has been a, a, there has been some folks that are aware that back in 2012 uh, we did do a peak flow alternative evaluation for Rowlett Creek. There's a lot of details on here, but really the the idea is there was three alternatives considered. Alternative one was to do uh, the plan that we currently are implementing, which is to treat all peak flows that arrive at Rowlett Creek at Rowlett Creek. Uh, there were two other alternatives that were considered at that time to maintain the average day capacity of Rowlett Creek, but transfer the peak flows during rainfall events. Uh, as you can see from uh, the evaluation results, uh, alternative one to treat peak flows at, arrive at Rowlett Creek at Rowlett Creek was most cost effective on a capital and an operating cost basis. 
So the plan as we move forward is to have phased peak flow upgrades. I've been talking about peak flow repeatedly, so let me kind of back up and, and say that uh, that occurs during rainfall events uh, when rainwater actually makes its way into the sewers and wastewater flows increase substantially. Uh, so it is typical that the amount of flow that you observe in the wastewater system during a major rainfall event may go up by threefold. So if normally we're treating, say, 15 million gallons per day during a normal rainfall event, it'll go up to 45 uh, very quickly, and then it'll taper back down over a series of probably 12 to 24 hours. Uh, so in terms of capacities, when we talk about wastewater capacities, we talk about average flow is kind of what happens on a normal day, but peak flows, we've got to accommodate and make sure that we're able to accommodate those. Uh, peak flow improvements will increase the reliability to ensure that we're treating all flows. Uh, one, one of the things that's very important to us is to ensure that we're properly conveying and treating all flows to meet water quality requirements of the receiving streams. Uh, the work that we do day in and day out is to protect public health and protect the environment uh, and do this while being a good neighbor. Uh, something of note that I think would be of interest is as we actually treat more peak flow at the facility, we still have to maintain our annual average daily flow for which we're rated. So the amount of flow that we're treating during normal times actually has to go down to stay in alignment with our TCEQ requirements. Uh, so treating more during these uh, rainfall events uh, when the wastewater is diluted uh, allows the flow or would require that the flow go down during normal times. Again, the annual average daily flow capacity is not changing and all process improvements are planned within the existing footprint. The graphic to the left talks you through the various phases of improvements that are planned. Uh, phase one is currently under construction, two is in design, and phase three uh, is into the future. This is an aerial view of the facility and the various phases of the work that are to occur uh, to accommodate uh, the improvements. Uh, phase one is reflected in blue and is currently under construction and near completion. Uh, phase two is actually broken into a 2A and 2B uh, and that is currently in design. And phase three is further into the future. The major point here is the white outline is the boundary of the actual plant process and all improvements are to remain within that white boundary uh, with no expansion outside the existing plant proper footprint. One of the things that's really critical in, in our business is to be a good neighbor. And when we think about that, there's a number of different ways that we have to think about it. Uh, odor being the biggest one, also sound uh, or noise and light pollution. And there's a number of things, but odor is definitely at the top of the list. And that is something that we have invested in significantly at Rowlett Creek. Uh, these are photos of some of the improvements that have been made over time in order to capture and treat odorous air prior to being discharged. Uh, we invest significantly and will continue to invest significantly to minimize off-site odor impacts, uh, enabling us to be a good neighbor. Uh, in addition to the work that's done at the plant, there's also considerable investment made out in the collection system. Uh, we spend on the order of $2 million per year dosing chemicals in the collection system in order to prevent uh, the formation and the release of odorous compounds through our communities uh, or at the plant. Additionally, at the treatment plant, as we talked about, we capture and treat odorous air at key locations. Uh, we use a number of different proven technologies to do that. And our staff performs regular inspections of that equipment to ensure that it's working correctly and makes adjustments where needed. Uh, something that's really important to us as an organization is we plan for, we design, we construct, we operate, and we maintain odor control equipment as a key part of the process. Additionally, we have uh, odor uh, complaint investigation and response process. 
Uh, this is, there are occasions when I, we have equipment failures or we have ongoing maintenance or construction activities that disrupt our normal. Uh, and so we have the opportunity to have citizens call in uh, and we've got a crew of people who specialize in response to odor concerns. Uh, and they are available on a 24 hour a day basis to respond to those concerns. Uh, a couple of things that we've done since the time that we began meeting with our neighbors in the last few months is there's a number of locations where we've actually been able to uh, improve the lighting at the facility. One of the things that uh, the neighbors made us aware of was that uh, there was some light pollution that was of concern from their homes. And so this is a map that depicts that there's a number of uh, decommissioned lights. Many of these are stadium style lightings that were very large and put off a significant amount of light pollution um, and a number of those we've actually been able to decommission. Additionally, there's a number more that we've been able to remove the larger lights and then replace them with shorter poles. Uh, and then we're also continuing to look to see if there's ways to continue to make that better. Uh, each of the lights that we've uh, installed are downward facing LEDs uh, that minimize those offsite impacts. Um, there's a number of other improvements that, uh, based on the feedback from the neighbors, we are working toward as well. Uh, we've had a few meetings with them, and another one is planned here in the coming weeks. Uh, and we appreciate the input and the feedback to understand uh, specifically how we can take measures to be a good neighbor. Uh, one of the, the things that we're currently working on is modifications to how you would enter the proposed operations building to maintain uh, the full berm without any disruption of that berm. And so as we continue to work with city staff on that, look forward to being able to share that with you. Um, there, the work that our people do out there, the, the 27 employees of the district there at Rowlett Creek, uh, they're, they're really dedicated and uh, they, they need a better facility to work from. And uh, for me as the person who um, oversees uh, that facility and our people, uh, we really could use your help in allowing us to construct a new operations building. Uh, as I was talking with uh, the individual that oversees that site on the way over, uh, he said, what else do you need me to do? Let me know what to jump, what hoop to jump through, I'll jump through it. Um, our people really do want to be a good neighbor and they need this new building and we appreciate your consideration for support. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Ms. Covington. Any questions uh, for Ms. Covington? Mayor Pro Tem? Hey, can you, um go back to i have two questions the the transfer slide that you had and then just i guess explain a little bit more um you said that um if we hit 24 if i'm understanding right if we hit the 24 mgd that's when we start we, we have we can't go past that capacity so you transfer but here you say um an average of 19 MGD is tr treated. So how does it work to make sure that we don't go over the capacity amount? What is your process for ensuring that you transfer at the right times? And then when we do get that peak flow, that you're not um, getting more than you can handle? Yeah, so in terms of having the right, in, in terms of annual average daily flow capacity, uh, which is what's reflected here, these are kind of average numbers over the course of a full year. This was 2020 actuals. Um, we don't try to treat right up to our capacity. So in this case, we were treating 19 million gallons per day of the 24 million gallon per day capacity. We typically like to have a little buffer um, there. We, we don't want to run full out all the time. Uh, and so there's, there's ba balancing between uh, the different facilities. So there's communication that occurs between our uh, operations folks at the Rowlett Creek plant and the Wilson Creek plant in order to facilitate that transfer and identify what the appropriate amount is. Uh, so there's a combination of things. There's um, 
There's control systems within the lift station that kind of have automatic ways that they do that, but then based on what's going on at the different facilities, they'll adjust uh, to what makes sense in order to have the most reliable operation. So if we've got some major maintenance happening at Rowlett Creek, uh, we actually may transfer more during that period of time to Wilson Creek, or if there's major maintenance at Wilson Creek, we may retain more at Rowlett. So there's some flexibility in order to figure out what's going to provide the most reliable operation for the two plants. Uh, and in order to ensure that we have the right amount of capacity, that really goes back to our planning and understanding the population growth and the trends that are happening in our area for the amount of flow that each, the amount of the people moving into the area are producing. And so we have to work many years in advance to ensure that we are planning for the appropriate capacity. Uh, in this case, up at Sister Grove is where we'll be providing that additional capacity. And then we'd be taking flows off further north in the system such that they don't make it down that far. Um, in terms of peak flow, unfortunately, we have had a number of peak flow violations at Rowlett Creek. Uh, I believe it's on the order of 30 uh, since 2018. Uh, have, there's been on the order of 30 days uh, that we have actually exceeded our rated peak flow capacity of 60 million gallons per day. Uh, and so that's something that uh, we do the best we can with what we've got, but we need to continue down the pathway of improving our peak flow handling capacity at the facility. Okay, and then my second question was in regards to the odors. You said that you have a response team that's available 24 hours a day. What is their process? If somebody calls and you get an odor complaint, what do they actually do um, to um, address that? And then on average, how many complaints do you receive for odors in the average month? Let's see. So odor complaints is uh, something. So when we receive an odor complaint, when they call our control room to make us aware that there's a concern, uh, right away the control room operator uh, calls someone on that odor crew that's on call, and they then deploy to the site. Uh, so the individual that uh, actually typically goes out to investigate actually lives in East Plano, so he gets there pretty quickly, usually within an hour of receiving the call. Uh, he then kind of goes around to the different uh, locations where we've got odor equipment and takes readings to see if any of the locations where we're doing the odor, the treatment of the odorous air are out of norm. Uh, so he, they, they inspect that site on a weekly basis so they kind of know what normal looks like uh, and they look to make sure that we're operating within our normal protocols. If they find something that is an exception, then they do what they can at that moment to correct it. Like oftentimes um, something that may be found is somebody opened a manhole lid uh, and there's a silicone seal that we will typically put in place in order to not have odorous air escaping the manhole lid. So they would then re-silicone the manhole lid. Uh, so they basically go out and try to identify what the source of the odor is uh, and then respond to it if they can identify something. Additionally, as part of that process, we ask the person who made the initial call if they would like a call back to understand what we found. And so as part of that process, we will call back the person who made the complaint to let them know what was found, if that's something they desire. Um, there was another part to your question. It was just the average, if you know the average um, number of complaints you're receiving a month for odors. So it, it varies significantly depending on what's going on. Um, I believe this year, I think we've only gotten one in 2021. Does anybody know any different? I think. As I recall, I think we've only gotten one this full year. Um, it varies quite a lot. Uh, it also varies seasonally, uh, and so that, that's something to consider as we kind of look at our trends. Sure. Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, Ms. Covington, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I had just a, a few questions. The first um, was just thinking ahead, obviously, uh, as you mentioned, there was decades ago, the discussion around this treatment plant was how do we increase capacity to plan for population growth? And now the conversation is, is different. Uh, I was just thinking about the, the Sister Grove treatment facility, which obviously is, is in a less populated area now, but there are projections for significant population growth in Northern Collin County. I just wanted to see if the water district is 
um, giving consideration to um, working with the, the municipality there for uh, land use planning or um, or acquiring, you know, buffer land around the Sister Grove treatment facility. Just curious what the water district is doing in that regard. Sure, sure. Yeah, one of the things that, that we're really proud of as an organization is this is a new wastewater treatment plant, the Sister Grove facility. And we did uh, a lot of outreach in advance of moving that project forward. Uh, and uh, we feel strongly that as a result of that outreach and meeting with neighbors and meeting with the local officials of New Hope and McKinney and Princeton, uh, we were able to go through the process of obtaining that permit without having uh, protestants. Uh, and so that was a really positive good news story. Uh, in terms of that facility, um, we have planned uh, for buffer in that case. Uh, so we did acquire quite a large piece of property in order to provide for that buffer uh, as we knew that we were planning for the long term and we were looking uh, very far into the future in terms of the build out capacity of that facility. Um, so in as we um, build new facilities, that's something that we look at. Um, but given that this was an existing facility that we took on the operation of, we did not have the opportunity mm -hmm. to necessarily uh, plan for that buffer the same way that sure. we can for a new facility. Sure. Well, well thank you for that response. I, I just uh, appreciate that y'all are looking at that and, you know, thinking of ways to avert a situation like the one that we're currently discussing. Uh, my second question uh, related to the, uh, the treatment process improvements remaining within the current footprint of the plant. Obviously, there's a request, and th this is the pending zoning case, for an office facility outside of the current footprint of the plant. And, and one could perhaps argue, and I think some are, are arguing, that if, uh, if the office facility were located within the current boundary of the plant, that would impact the ability to um, to to uh, keep all of those treatment process improvements within the current boundary of the plant, and that essentially, as a result, uh, allowing the office facility outside of the current footprint of the plant indirectly um, indirectly allows more uh, treatment process improvements at the Rowlett Creek location than would otherwise be possible. Do you agree with that assessment, or uh, if not? Uh, 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 why not, if you could provide uh, information, so thank you. Sure, uh, so I brought up the slide that kind of shows where the improvements are to occur. Uh, the red box in the center of the graphic that's labeled generators is the location of the, uh, the existing operations building. Uh, and so the, the generators are there in order to provide reliability in times when we lose power, uh, which happens sometimes. Uh, and so uh, what's proposed to go in that location is not actually treatment equipment, it's auxiliary equipment associated with backup mm -hmm. power. Uh, and so if we did not, if the operations building was to remain there, we would have to find another place for those generators. Uh, but given that the original plant actually has a lot of the electrical gear that comes into and a lot of the lines uh, feed into that operations building, it's efficient in order to mm -hmm. have those generators placed there. Uh, and those generators are something that's necessary to have the backup power as required by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and is also a best just good mm -hmm. practice. Um, for sure. Well, th thank you for that information. And then my final question is following up on the Mayor Pro Tem's question about odor control. Um, in addition to the uh, current odor control measures that are in place, if, uh, if money was no object, what other odor control measures are out there? And um, if, if it, I guess I'm interested in, in what the district has looked at in terms of of, you know, th this is something that's technologically feasible, but it's not logistically feasible or financially feasible and just understanding the considerations there. So I, I've been on staff with the district for a number of years now. Prior to that, I was an engineering consultant and I worked with water utilities across the North Texas area uh, to work on facilities such as this. And 
One of the things that is quite impressive about North Texas Municipal Water District is how seriously we take odor control. And so the measures that we take are much above and beyond what is normal within the industry. Uh, and so pretty much all of the things that are kind of ways to mitigate odor, we've kind of checked most of those boxes. There's not really low hanging fruit in terms of more places to capture odorous air and treat it before it's emitted into the atmosphere. Um, with that said, we are looking and actually have recently in the last two or three months changed our capital improvement program to change the technology that we plan to use to upgrade our solids handling facilities. Uh, so the next major phase of improvements is phase 2A and it's going to happen within the box labeled solids handling. And historically, the technology we have used to handle our solids, um, there's a full building of odorous air, I guess is the easy way to say it. It's a technology called belt filter presses and uh, the odorous air is fully in the building. Uh, with what we're moving toward, uh, we're using a technology called centrifuges where it's just contained within the actual equipment itself and you're pulling the odorous air off of the equipment rather than the whole building. So as we're opening and closing doors in order to remove the containers of the solids from the facility, we're gonna see reduced odors. Additionally, we're gonna have uh, fewer truckloads because we get a greater um, efficiency and removal of the water from those solids. So that's one example of something that we've actually changed in the last few months that's kind of an incremental step in terms of looking for ways to reduce odors, but there's really not low-hanging fruit that we haven't already implemented at that facility. Okay, well, thank you for all of that information, Ms. Covington. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. Covington, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a few questions. Um, my understanding is that you had um, a meeting with some of the local residents sometime, um, I guess, a week or two weeks uh, previous. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, we did have a meeting. It was the second uh, meeting with neighbors. Uh, I was able to attend the first one. I was not there personally in the second one, but a few staff members who were present. Uh, so for the June one, you were not there? Correct. I see. So um, I, I did get um, some of the uh, residents who did uh, respond back and, and send me um, sort of a summary of what happened. And I, I just want to sort of follow up on that. Now, um, one of the questions that they uh, issue that they raise is with regard to the um, SUP that um, the water district is asking for, um, the response was that actually uh, you guys didn't ask for it, but it was rather the city who has made the suggestion for the SUP. Is, is that true? So the SUP, we have an existing SUP. Uh, and that has been in place for a long time, and there is a need to update that SUP. Uh, and, and in terms of if uh, the city requested it or we initiated it, I, I don't recall, but I will say that it makes sense to update the SUP, and I think we're uh, working um, with the city in order to do so. Well, my understanding is that the previously, uh, the, the um, I guess the, the issue that was <clears throat> the last meeting was because there was an SUP proposed by the water district for expansion into an administrative building that was table. And based on the meeting that was uh, that had happened in June, um, apparently the resident says that the district was asking uh, really it was a city decision rather than a um, the, the the district desires to move forward with modification of the SUP and made that request through the planning and zoning process. Uh, I believe that that also makes sense to city, I can't speak for city staff, but uh, it makes sense that um, as we move forward to um, identify the boundaries of the SUP that we're, we're working hand in hand with city staff in order to do what makes sense in that regard. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Probably not, but we'll, I'll come back to that one. That, that's fine. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, we can work on a, a legislative history through our planning staff to be able to report that back to city council as far as the filing and, and how that project came forward. But I think on this discussion, we're 
Uh, we've asked Mr. Covington more to focus on the operational side, especially some of those concerns that the, the citizens have, have focused on uh, that we're hearing back from the community. All right. So I have a follow up question, too. So the, the next question is, is with regard to what you had talked about in your slides about the cost of um, using Wilson and Sister versus Rowlett for um, the water treatment. So my question to you is, um, even though it looks like right now um, it costs, um, it, it doesn't look as cost effective for treatment to be done in, in Wilson as well as Sister. Now, as, the, um, as these plants starts developing or um, starts to be, starts to grow, will the cost come down with regard to treatment in those plants. Can we go back to that slide, please? That, that you just passed it. Oh. So this particular slide is speaking only about peak flow improvements, not about, uh, there was no consideration at this time for decommissioning of the Rowlett Creek Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant as part of this evaluation. I, I'm not asking for a decommission. I guess what I'm asking is that because there's currently um, a discussion of possibly um, higher flow going to Rowlett Creek, but possibly going to um, Wilson Creek and Sister, Sister uh, what is it called? Sister, Sister Grove. Grove. Uh, yes, instead, or at least having that as an alternate for um, the, the overflows. Um, so I thought this was talking about the fact that the alternatives are, are uh, highly cost ineffective. But my question to that is, is there, as the, um, the two other treatment plants starts to grow and expand, will the cost come down with mm -hmm. regard to that? Do, do you understand my question? I, I believe so. Let me okay. make an attempt. And if I don't answer your question, feel free to offer another. Um, so in, in regards to, we'll, we'll talk about it in terms of capital and in terms of operating and talking specifically about peak flows. Um, we have now built out uh, Wilson Creek, uh, which is the one immediately north of there from an average flow and a peak flow capacity. So this at evaluation actually is no longer really even applicable. We would have to send the flows up to Sister Grove, uh, which is uh, quite a bit further even north, uh, which is where we have room uh, and the water quality, receiving waters have capacity in order to take additional flows. Uh, and so will it become more cost effective? No, I would anticipate that it would become less cost effective as we would have to consider sending those flows all the way to Sister Grove uh, rather than to Wilson Creek. Uh, that's a, from a capital standpoint. Uh, from an operating standpoint, um, water flows downhill naturally, um, that's uphill. And so you have not only the cost associated with the treatment itself, but you have the energy cost in order to transfer those flows uphill. Uh, so it would also be uh, less cost effective. So are you saying that the alternative that was pr proposed in this slide does not exist anymore? Correct. Okay, can you go back to that slide so I can just take a sure. look? Sure. That one. So alternative two really is not, is no longer something that is um, a, a possibility. That's what you're saying? Correct. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Sure. Councilman Williams. Yes, thank you, Jenna. Um, I have a couple of follow-on questions based on what uh, the Mayor Pro Tem and Deputy Mayor Pro Tem said. Um, <clears throat> first, regarding uh, what was just said about Wilson Creek being built out, um, how does that mean built out? Rowlett Creek was supposed to be built out as well. So what, what would make Alternative 2 impossible now? I wouldn't say impossible, I would say not feasible, and it's really based on the receiving waters. Uh, when we made the decision to move forward with the Sister Grove Water Resource Recovery Facility, we did a similar evaluation to determine does it make sense to continue to expand Wilson Creek or should we consider an alternative site? 
And the outcome of that evaluation was that we needed to move forward with an alternative site. And it was really driven by the receiving water quality uh, being Lake Levon, uh, less than the site itself. Okay, and <clears throat> the, the O&M cost here for alternative one, which is treating the high flows at Rowlett Creek, is given here as 1.2 million, but I was uh, sent a spreadsheet that shows 2.2 million O&M costs after uh, 2026, when all the phases were complete. I also thought the capital cost was going to be much more significant at uh, Rowlett Creek. Uh, can you tell me, is that 79 million supposed to encompass all phases? So the, the numbers that are shown here um, are from a 2012 evaluation and they're not uh, the current estimated cost. Um, with that said, the phase two, there's a number of components that have been brought into the three phased improvements at Rowlett Creek that uh, provide uh, improvements for aging infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, the com entirety of Phase 2A is related to solids improvements that were not part of this evaluation but are necessary because that infrastructure is aging and will, is necessary to provide reliable service. Uh, so it's not, you can't really look at the sum of the current capital improvement program for Rowlett and this evaluation as there's a number of components that have been brought into that capital improvement program due to aging infrastructure. This was really just looking at peak flow improvements in order to have an apples to apples comparison of those improvements alone. At that time in 2012. Correct. <clears throat> okay. We have escalated from 2012 to 2021 dollars with a 3% inflation rate. All right. Are you, are you able to give the current estimates? And you spoke about if we were to divert uh, flows to Sister Grove, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is a thousand acre site. Is that accurate? That's okay. Correct. Compared to the 10 acre site, roughly, of uh, Rowlett. Um, you, you said that to divert to Sister Grove now uh, would be more expensive. Do you have a bead on just how much more expensive updated for 2021 estimates given the uh, infrastructure changes you just mentioned? That is not something that we've done analysis of. Um, as we just look at the, the cost, we would have to, are, are, let me ask, clarify, are you sure. talking peak flows only or average <laughs> capacity? Uh, well, peak flow seems to be the more pressing matter, peak what flow. the justification for the upgrades has primarily been. Yes. Uh, so I would say, for the most part, peak flows, but in general, everything. Okay. <clears throat> so we, we haven't done an evaluation. Uh, in order to facilitate that, we would have to be able to convey, I think it's on the order of 60 million gallons per day, 16 miles north, um, which would be substantial. At peak. Um, yes, at peak. Right. Yeah, because uh, currently we can, we're um, at 60 million gallons per day. I should, I misspoke. I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. Sure. We're already adding 17 and a half as part of phase one. Uh, so it would be the 60 minus 17 and a half that is still outstanding to be accomplished by phases two and three. Okay. Um, I do not have a cost for that. That's not something that we have looked at um, as, um, as engineering judgment tells us that it's, in our, our mission is to provide cost-effective services. Mm -hmm. it, it just tells us that those two things don't align. Okay. Do you happen to have the updated costs for the Rowlett Creek upgrades in OM? Do not. Is anyone in the audience? Mark, do you have those? No. I'm not going yeah, to do any future have, value calculation at three percent in my head. I can I can take note. We can get Okay, that thank you. you. <clears throat> and then with respect to the mayor pro tem's question uh, previously about odors um, and Councilman Riccadelli's did I did I understand correctly that when somebody does uh, uh, call your hotline, I guess, uh, with an odor complaint, that you check the sources on the site? Mm -hmm. Because my understanding and my experience in that area is that the odors aren't necessarily coming from um, the site itself, but from the sewer lines around the uh, vicinity, um, presumably from uh, backflows in the sewer lines, which I appreciate all of the odor control uh, measures that are being taken on the site. But if, uh, if the problem is predominantly in the sewer lines themselves, then no amount of uh, odor control on the site or the tanks is going to uh, alleviate that problem. 
So when, when our uh, odor control individuals respond to those complaints, they, they will start at the plant and then they will go out and look further beyond. So on occasion, there have been times when they have found uh, some of the manholes, say, in our infrastructure um, are, are the source and, and they've been able to correct that. Uh, and so they will, I, they'll, they kind of know, and there's been times in the past where we had some like bypass punk pumping um, happening as part of a capital improvement program. And so they'll go and look at places that they think may be suspect. Uh, they typically look uh, within the district's infrastructure, whether it's um, pipelines or the plant, to identify the source and, and respond to that appropriately. Uh, if it is a, a component of a city infrastructure um, and it's in close proximity to our stuff, we'll work with the city on that or just correct it if we find it. Um, we don't typically go up into the neighborhoods and, and look um, for the problems within the city infrastructure. Um, we typically are focused on kind of looking in, in our areas. Um, that raises a good question on what it sounds like are the rare occasions when somebody does call your number. Um, how does that work? What information do you get from the caller, like where they're experiencing the odor? Yeah. And uh, so if, if they're experiencing at their home, which I imagine would be most frequent uh, for somebody calling, does anybody actually go out to the proximity of the call to see yes. if they notice anything? If so, how long is it? I think it was 24 hours before uh, they're responded to, um, but how long before somebody goes out there? So typically they respond quite <clears throat> Quickly, uh, we have work orders that we can kind of go back and be able to see what time the call came in and when they responded. And typically, it's within a few hours. Um, and they, we do collect a number of data points when people call in. Uh, so we'll collect the location that they noticed it. Uh, we'll collect the weather conditions, like what way is the wind blowing. Um, we'll collect uh, their what any characteristics of the odor that they can describe. So there's kind of a questionnaire that our um, control room operator goes through in order to collect information that may be helpful as we're going out to investigate. Um, and typically, I think they're getting there pretty expeditiously. Um, and we do ask that they call as soon as they notice it because they can; those odors can kind of come and go depending on the winds and such. Uh, right. And so we do try to make an effort to get out there pretty quickly. Okay, and, and if the... Odor is coming apparently from the city owned lines, the city managed lines. How do you work with the city? Um, and, and actually, uh, an additional question to that, maybe for Jerry, is uh, or Mark, <clears throat> how many calls does the city get regarding odor compared to the district? So, oftentimes, it, if it's a city um, thing, it's typically that the manhole um, is emitting. And so it's common that we will just put silicone around that manhole lid and put it back in place. Um, there have been some times when we've coordinated. Yeah, and I can tell you, in this area, recently we haven't got a lot. Now, we were dealing with Mr. Linden. And after we had discussion with Mr. Linden, we actually hired a consultant to go out there and do some monitoring, both closer to the plant and out in the collection system to try to identify where the source of order is. So it's something, and like Jenna mentions, there'll be times you go out there, you get a complaint, you go out there, there won't be no smell. We had another part of town where it was a frequent problem. I've been out there a dozen times, never smelled it. Channel 8 calls me out there, I go out there that day, that's the only time you smell it. So, you know, it's frustrating sometimes to deal with because it's not something that's a constant. Yeah, it comes and goes. It comes and it goes. <clears throat> And typically, I can tell you in the past, most of the complaints I had gotten in the past was the area north of the treatment plant, across where the golf course used to be. Now, most of the complaints we're hearing about now are more to the west, which I hadn't heard that much about in the past. In my experience, being out there, it's, it's also hit or miss. But it can be pretty far away from the plant itself that you smell it. Okay. Um, so on the, on the district website, and for that matter, for our website, um, the phone number for people to call is several clicks away from the homepage. Um, would it be possible to put the number to call prominently on the homepage? It doesn't have to say, if you smell bad stuff, call this number, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but make it more uh, public friendly to give them an avenue to uh, report issues. That's something that we can take a look at. 
Okay. And one thing too, you know, Jen has mentioned some of the treatments that I do. Some of them are more difficult for us to do because we don't have facilities close to the plant. Because most of the time when we do injection, it's something that we're doing at a lift station. Mm -hmm. There really aren't that many lift stations in that immediate area where we could treat it. Now we do have carbon canisters that we can put out there, which is a passive way of, of dealing with the odor as it comes out of the system. But the treatment process itself is probably better to address the issue than trying to just mask the odor. Right. Well, I did, I did look through the report that uh, your consultant generated with the measurements and they, there seemed to be a strong correlation to storm events, um, increasing the, uh, the, um, the strain on the, and what you it's find out patches. sometimes is that as the amount of sewage gets higher up in the pipe, what it does, it tends to force the air out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you think that when the flow gets faster, it'll suck it along, but sometimes it doesn't actually just forces it out. That's the one thing we experience in the other part of town is that the higher flows force the air out. And that's not pleasant air. No, it's, it is not. Not for anybody. Right. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. You. Thank you very much. Do we have a speaker's card for this item? Okay. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate right. the information. All right. Thank you. The next item is discussion and direction of the American Rescue Plan, Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. City Manager Israelson. Mayor and Council, we have, uh, I've provided a, a memo to you uh, late last week regarding some funds that we've received from the federal government from the American Rescue Plan uh, Act. The city of Plano is going to receive a total of $36.4 million over two tranches of money. We have received the first, which came in uh, June 1st of this year. So we received $18.2 million. We will receive 50%, uh, the other 50% next year, approximately at the same time. Uh, for the city's use. We have done a lot of research uh, through our staff on the uses uh, of the ARPA funds and how the city might most cleanly claim the funds. Our goal is always to make sure that we are in 100% compliance with uh, the act so that we uh, end up with our auditors and our uses complying with the intent of the federal government. After reviewing all the options and looking at, um, at the possible uh, impacts to uh, the city budget as well as city services. Staff is recommending that we claim 100% of the funds for this year, just for the, the 2021 uh, tranche, uh, under the revenue replacement for the provision of government services. We have done uh, calculations through our budget department. Karen Rhodes Whitley has done those. And we have uh, plenty of losses to be able to claim all $18.2 million under revenue loss. And so that we, we believe that we can do that. Uh, the only prohibited uses that you have when you have the revenue replacement is the city is prohibited from using these to replenish any reserves or rainy day, rainy day funds. So they can go into operations, but you cannot put those into reserves. After doing some analysis of the impact on what uh, our funds have experienced under COVID, the Convention and Tourism Fund, the Recreation Revolving Fund, and of course the General Fund have all been impacted. We are recommending uh, at this time that we transfer uh, of the of the eighteen point two million dollars one million dollars to the convention and tourism fund one point five million dollars to the recreation revolving fund and fifteen point seven to the general fund. Additionally, in the general fund from the fifteen point seven million dollars, staff has identified uh, a community project that we think would enhance. Uh, the authority and the project that was approved most recently in our recent bond referendum regarding traffic signalization throughout the city of Plano. Uh, we have identified additional enhancements uh, for the traffic detection uh, system that we have, and we believe that utilizing uh, $8 million uh, for a traffic signal upgrade program to enhance the um, uh, traffic signal project by adding that vehicle detection system would provide a great value to uh, the community. It would help enhance our public safety and uh, is the number one priority that uh, staff has identified for use of those funds in the general fund. So we think that with traffic uh, gaining some um, uh, additional momentum with the COVID starting to wane, that we think investing those funds towards that project would have uh, benefits across the city. This paired with our CIP funds, 
where we are replacing the traffic signal boxes themselves, the control panels, as well as the um, hardware and software inside would have a great benefit to improving traffic flow throughout the city of Plano. And we think with all that we hear from our citizens about traffic in Plano, that this would be a high priority for the, uh, for the city. The remaining $7.7 .7 million could be appropriated through the uh, normal budget cycle that we could bring back to the city council as part of our budget discussion. We could identify and then provide a line item um, aspect of what we would be funding through that as part of that budget process. But with that, that is our staff recommendation and I'd be happy to answer any questions or have any feedback from city council. Any questions? Councilman Grady? Uh, just a couple uh, and to the uh, city manager. Um, you uh, decided to make a claim for $18.2 million um, and use that 100% uh, or 100% claim on that $18.2 million. And you said that there was a, about another $18.2 million sitting out there. Has there been any discussion of the claim on that and uses of that? Uh, Councilman, we've actually claimed $36.4 million. Okay. So the, the federal government is putting that out in two tranches. So we've claimed all $36.4. We've actually received eighteen point two. Uh, our approach on that would be to wait. Uh, the federal guidance has been evolving and maturing over the last uh, several weeks. We anticipate it continuing to evolve over the next several months. So our thought was to bring that back for consideration next year to the city council once that's matured, but we have not made a recommendation on the future allocation uh, of the additional $18.2 million. Okay, so that's still sitting, sitting out there. The other question that I had is when we were talking about the, um, uh, the automated traffic system, is this similar to um, our neighboring city that uses a system of this nature? This is, I think what you're asking is, uh, there is a, um, a program that actually works with the vehicle system itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the city of Frisco has one that allows you to understand when the signals are progressing. What we're talking about for the traffic signal detection system is actually a small camera kind of in the middle of the mast arm that's horizontal uh, that actually watches and sees when a car enters the field of vision for the uh, intersection and allows the uh, allows the hardware to assess that there's a vehicle there and it needs to pr pr move through the cycling. This is actually an efficient way of going about this, but uh, that in combination with the hardware and software that we would have would allow our staff to have a more global uh, perspective of the um, traffic signal system throughout the city of Plano and allow us to take uh, some advances to bring that all up to uh, what I'll call state-of-the-art or current standards of, uh, of traffic signals. But the detection system itself is actually a very skinny, if you're out driving home, a very skinny pole with a camera on top of it facing uh, you as you're looking at the light. And that really detects those uh, those vehicles pulling up to the light and tells it to cycle through. And the, the final question on this is um, there is a addition to this system, I believe, that reads the um, transponders off the of cell phones to determine whether or not there is a vehicle there. And typically what happens is if a bicyclist, for example, approaches the intersection, the camera may or may not detect um, that small of an object. Um, but the cell phone, if the biker is carrying the cell phone, it detects that there is an object there and may then determine, oh yes, it's a bicycle, I need to switch the signals. Um, is, is that a possibility in the future. I, I'll have to check with our, our traffic engineers on that. What I can tell you is uh, we are building a new traffic management center here up in our engineering suite uh, up on the second floor. Uh, and uh, I will have to check on that functionality specifically, but our traffic engineers will probably be able to answer that pretty quickly. Um, but I do know that it is an upgrade uh, between the CIP program and what this would do. This would be an upgrade to our hardware, software, and then some of the, the field devices to bring us up to that um, that current standard. Okay, because when I, I observed it um, at the Council of Governments, it was very interesting that the cars were interacting with the, with the signal systems through um, the cell phone devices, and, and thus they were interrelated with each other, and then it could determine exactly who needed to go next. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I was just um, hoping that as you come up with the um, items for the remaining 7.7 .7 million, um, that we could consider um, projects that may have either been on the um, CIP or other items that may help us reduce items that we would have maybe had to um, use debt for so that we could 
reduce that need. Absolutely. We're happy to, to consider that. We have a number of requests coming through the budget cycle right now that I think we could apply to. And we can itemize those lists and bring those back as part of the budget process, but as a separate list for council to be able to consider and look at as we bring that back forward. But we're happy to do that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mark, th thank you for this staff recommendation. Uh, first, a question, make sure that I'm understanding correctly. If I am understanding correctly, uh, the we've suffered enough losses that we could claim the whole $18.2 million through the general fund, or is that not correct? We're actually uh, asking, uh, Councilman, that we uh, claim 157 for the general mm -hmm. fund, uh, a million for convention and tourism, and 1.5 for the recreation revolving, but our losses actually exceed those numbers. Thank you. And, and where I was going with that is uh, a lot of times when we look at items and we're not yet in the budget process, we try to preserve flexibility so that we can look at everything holistically, all of the city's needs and make decisions during the budget process. So I, I, I wanted to inquire about the possibility of claiming the entire 18.2 million through the general fund. And then of course, the transfers to the rec revolving fund and the convention and tourism fund, if, if those are found through the budget process to be the best use of those funds, those could still be, as I understand it, transferred out of the general fund uh, to those funds. Uh, what are your thoughts on that possibility? Right now, and we had a, a, a question about that as far as without those transfers to the Convention and Tourism Fund and mm -hmm. Recreation Revolving Fund, what would the, the status of the fund be without those funds? Right now, the Recreation Revolving sits at a, a negative 119 days. Uh, if we transfer the funds in, we will be at plus 44 days. The Convention and Tourism would be at a negative 10 days and with the, two, with the transfer would have uh, plus 33 days. So as it stands right now, both of those funds are in need of assistance. And so we think that it uh, going into the budget um, season, that would be our recommendation is to make sure that we took care of those funds that were most severely hit during the um, COVID uh, situation. So I think our recommendation would stick uh, with that to make sure that those funds are operating at a level that meets with our financial policies. Certainly. Thank you. And I, I certainly understand the, the recommendation. One additional question on, on this subject, and then I have a, a couple other things. But uh, how is hotel occupancy tax collection uh, looking for this year? Because I know it was it was significantly down, obviously, during the pandemic. As things have improved, are we seeing increasing uh, HOT collection? Or? We are seeing a rebound uh, across the organization. The, the only uh, fund that tended to do actually very well during COVID was our golf course fund. Um, people were playing a lot of golf. Uh, so the, the, the golf course fund did, did very, very well. Uh, the other funds that we've seen, we have seen a, um, a pretty precipitous rebound uh, from those. So we're feeling better about next year. We're still in the recovery mode for this year, but overall uh, we have seen a rebound uh, in, in kind of the most recent uh, several months. Well, thank you. And, and so my, my recollection of the Convention and Tourism Fund over the past several years is that the amount uh, uh, of revenue in that fund has increased substantially and that that's been the trend that was interrupted, obviously, by the pandemic. And I guess what I'm getting at there is that we, you know, we might expect that if we return to normal travel patterns that that fund may recover on its own. Uh, and, and so that was that was one thought that I had. But in general, uh, given the ability to um, to transfer from the general fund to the other funds and the uh, desirability from my viewpoint of, of being able to evaluate everything holistically during the budget cycle, mm -hmm. I personally think it makes the most sense to claim all 18.2 million through the general fund and then evaluate possible transfers to the convention and tourism fund and the rec revolving fund along with other potential uses of those funds during the budget process. Uh, and I also wanted to echo the mayor pro tem's comments, uh, you know, on the critical infrastructure investment, uh, potential use of these funds. I think taking things that are already on the CIP uh, and, uh, um, you know, and, and, and using it for that, I mean, that that could that could decrease our, our debt going forward and I think would be would be a good use. But that would that, you know, preserving that flexibility and looking at these recommendations again as part of the holistic budget process would, you know, would be would be my, my proposed direction as an individual council member. Any other questions, Councilman Williams? Uh, yes, a, a follow-up question to that. Um, I, 
I think that the that Councilman Riccardelli's um, idea about going into the general, putting everything into the general fund, uh, makes sense. But I do want to ask, what kind of um, expenditures are we anticipating for both the uh, Convention and Tourism and the Recreation Revolving Fund um, compared to what we would experience in a normal year? So is is replenishing the um, <clears throat> the working days of those funds? Um, going to be reflective of what we would expect in a normal year, or are they still significantly behind in expenditures? So this year, obviously, they've been impacted by the first half of the year. We were still under COVID, uh, COVID scenario uh, and experiencing the impacts of, of COVID to our, uh, to our operations through the first half of the year. The last half of the year, we have been progressing, as you all know, quickly towards uh, reopening, and we were actually kind of a little bit ahead of uh, some other cities in being able to provide our, our full services. So we have seen um, a, a precipitous increase, as I mentioned uh, to, to Councilman Riccardelli, that uh, we have seen a precipitous increase. However, the recreation revolving fund, the, the way that it funds is basically the classes that you would take at a recreation center that you sign up and you take a yoga class or a spin class, whatever it might be, those funds actually pay their instructors out of this fund and it becomes a self-sustaining fund. But there are overhead costs associated with that fund to, to operate it that way that we are also continuing to fund. So to your question, uh, we're, we're, when you space out the number of people, you have less people per class, you still have some of those costs inherent in there. It's been a slow recovery for that fund. We do anticipate next year getting back up to normal. So I think October 1st is gonna be a very different scenario than where we were May 1st. Um, but I think that, that helping those funds recover from that so that we're covering some of those overhead costs, we're covering some of those normal administrative costs uh, is important so that we're abiding by our fiscal policies. And what about the, um, I, I appreciate that explanation of the Recreation Revolving Fund. What about the Convention and Tourism Fund? The Convention and Tourism Fund, as, as Council is aware, is, is made up of hotel motel taxes. That's really where uh, the majority of the revenue comes in from there. And what we do is we actually spend, we actually have a number of our staff members uh, that are funded uh, out of the Convention and Tourism Fund, including some elements of the um, Plano Event Center. And so we have uh, marketing and um, convention uh, services in there, which we're seeing a, an increase in interest coming back to Plano for tournaments and conventions and things of that nature that are coming back as well. Uh, but those administrative costs uh, were there during, uh, during COVID and we maintained our staffing levels working through that. But the, the hotel uh, aspect is while it is recovering, uh, it did take uh, the first six months, much like everything else, uh, through COVID was uh, was abnormal until it was down. How, um, considering that we had to keep paying the administrative costs while the hot taxes were way down, um, how did that impact um, our uh, days of capital for that fund since the beginning of the pandemic? Well, as it stands right now, without this this as without this adjustment, we're going to sit at, at minus ten days, looking for this budget next next year's budget if we don't uh, uh, shift funds towards that fund. Okay, I thought you meant that if we did. Oh, you mean if we if we okay. do nothing? So if we do nothing, Correct. so is it currently rested about minus ten days from that where is, we ordinarily strive to be? We normally strive to be close to to thirty days uh, for for the majority of our funds. Uh, 30 days of operating capital is, is kind of the norm. Mm -hmm. And right now, as we have this fund projected, it would be a minus 10 days okay. uh, based upon what we have budgeted for next year. Okay. So what I had taken you to mean earlier was that if we moved everything to the general fund, then uh, we would subtract 10 days from this fund. But I'm hearing now that we are actually at negative 10 days Correct. with zero current days of capital. So we're just Correct. Drawing on borrowed money. That's correct. From the general so we, we consider each fund separately. So while we do have transfers and there are interfund movements, mm -hmm. we're considering both of those independently. Okay. So we're in we're in the negative for we that are. fund currently. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. So um so Mark, I, I, I think I understand and I think I understand where um uh, Councilman Riccadoli is at. So um my understanding is uh, we, we are going to be able to claim $36.4 million for, for the COVID, uh, uh, I guess, the American Rescue Plan Act, right? Right now, we are in uh, possession of $18.2 million. 
And I guess Anthony is wanting to look at distribution um, in total rather than have specific ones carved out. But the reason why the staff is recommending that these two particular items be carved out is because number one, convention and tourism has to do with our public image. Mm -hmm. um, and considering summer coming up, there's a lot of events coming in that's, that City of Plano requires promotion. <laughs> Am I understanding that correctly? It's and, not strictly due to the, the public image of the city. It, it has, happens to be the fund that was uh, impacted most severely through the down, during the uh, COVID. down, correct, through the downturn because of COVID. And, and that was the one that basically nothing happened during the year because nobody was coming in to do anything. And, and therefore that was impacted the most. And correct. the second thing that was impacted the most was recreation because no one was going to classes. Correct. And so, we still need to keep the lights on. We still need to keep the staff, you know, a, a, a skeleton crew going to maintain the facility, even though there was nobody going. Correct. Um, so these are the two that are impact the most. And that's the reason why the city is, the staff is recommending, we take care of those two first, and then whatever's remaining, then we'll deal with those holistically. I, I, am I understanding that correctly? So we're, we're recommending that we take care of, of those two first. Correct. And then for the general fund, we are recommending that we, um, again, as part of that, that we set aside because we're in the project planning uh, phase right now of starting to work on that traffic signal project. And so we think it would be prudent to set that aside, knowing the, uh, the concerns of the citizens about traffic in Plano to move that forward. So our recommendation, and it's up to council, council can provide the direction and we, you know me, tomorrow we'll go to work. Uh, but the 7.7 .7 would be the aspect that we bring back as part of that process um, for, for council as part of the whole. Yeah, but we still have another 18.2 18, 18 million dollars next year. that's coming next, in. Next June. Next June. Yes. Right. So that would also be um, put into the general fund as well. It, it wouldn't now go to another traffic type. Um, no, that allocation would have to come back through the city of council for appropriation. We don't we don't uh, spend money without appropriations from from in direction from city council. Can Thank I just you, ask Thanks one clarifying question. question? You had said that the money is not allowed to be used for rainy day type funds, right? So when you say that we're going to bring these funds up to 44 days and 33 days of working capital, that do, is not considered violating a rainy day by having that much extra. I've had our, our accounting and our budget people work through this specifically to make sure that we are in compliance and they have told me we are in compliance on how we would be able to use that. So the it would be put, brought into the fund for operations, which would have a cascading effect within the fund. Okay. Joey. Uh, that actually raises a question. We had discussed implementing a rainy day fund for this upcoming fiscal year. Would this interfere with that? We could not use these funds for that. So we have already started creating the rainy day fund. We deposited $2.2 million, as you're, you're well aware, from uh, the North Texas Municipal Water District uh, settlement. And so as part of that, we have created a rainy day fund that we have partitioned out uh, that is only available for council direction to, to be able to be used. If there are other additional funds, it could not come from these specifically. But if there are other funds within the general fund uh, that allow that to be um, uh, bolstered, we could consider that during uh, during the part of the budget discussion. So that's not going to run afoul of the fungibility of money? Uh, we're, we're going to make sure we track these very carefully so that we don't run afoul because, uh, Council, I will assure you my priority is not to repay a single dollar of the $18.2 million uh, moving into the future. Thank you. Mark, question, question for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as I understand it, I know on the, uh, the funds coming in, they, nothing can be used to create a new program or, or to fund ongoing, you know, effort. But uh, as far as doing something, uh, I, I do believe that uh, that we can or we're able to do something uh, public safety-wise uh, 
uh, with funds should, you know, should there be excess uh, funding available. It doesn't sound like we'll be able to do that during this first go round, but in, in the second phase as we come to it. So I guess the question is, what is that your understanding as well? Is that, for lack of a better word, let's say that uh, that we take we apply some of the uh, the funding and work in conjunction with both chiefs of both fire and, and police and create a thank you fund for our public safety, uh, you know, uh, folks that uh, could be a pay enhancement or something for those that that put in, you know, exceptional overtime during the COVID crisis. Uh, the, Snowmageddon crisis come you know comes to mind too, and, and the excellent work uh, that our, that our public safety did for us there. Would something like that be possible as you understand it now? I know we'll talk about this for the next budget cycle, but I'm just just curious what we'll be thinking about it. So, Councilman, one one of the things that I would share with you is in in addressing the traffic <clears throat> signal project. Uh, we have concurred, and and I've talked with my deputies and and our staff. We think that that upgrading the traffic signal program enhances our public safety ability as well. So it will include battery backups, things like that, that help in emergencies that will uh, will assist in our public safety. As far as the salaries go, um, I know that there's been a lot of federal dollars floating into um, uh, municipalities and states and counties and everything else. The CARES funds had different rules than the ARPA funds do. And so there's different constraints on these with regard to salaries and how you can go about uh, applying these funds. Uh, what I can share with you is uh, coming up in your budget, I've met with every single department and I'm trying to make sure I stay on track on, on this aspect, but since we're talking about funding, taking care, taking care of our employees uh, is my number one priority and it will be reflected in this budget. But as far as next year's, uh, as I said, the next year's funding, the 18.2, if the, um, as that comes back, as the uh, guidance matures, if there are options like that, that will be up to council to determine um, what we can use those funds for, and they will go about that appropriation at that time. But I'm open to um, any opportunities that are there to, uh, to uh, consider those funds. Great, and I, and I know you are. That's why I wanted to put the bug in your ear. I'll say one last thing on this subject. So I have the pleasure of meeting with the big city mayors uh, twice a month, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, um, Arlington, Fort Worth. We talk about this fund every single time. We, we actually met this morning and talked about this and uh, some shared uh, about what they were going to do with these funds. And uh, the number one was lost funds that everyone has experienced and public safety, mobility, transportation, they, they were all on this list that all the mayors across Texas uh, both all mentioned. And so it's, it's fairly common, the, the needs for, for where these funds are going. So uh, this, is, this is very parallel to what everybody else is talking about. So with that being said, uh, we'll, we'll move forward and look forward to uh, the budget cycle when we can uh, start pinpointing specific areas. So mayor, I would like to, to make sure that we have direction as staff to sure. whether it's the recommendation, cause we are still putting our budget together. And so as we're putting that together, this has an impact on what we're bringing back. And I wanna make sure that it is uh, within the spirit and the direction of council. So if we could, uh, whether it's a hand vote or uh, anything for direction, I would really appreciate that from council so that we know as staff what to bring back. Okay, so uh, if you're in favor of uh, the city manager's recommendation, please raise your hand. Can I just ask one question? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. The, the million dollar restoring the arts funds, the million dollars there, does that just mean putting it back where it was or giving back to make up for the losses during the pandemic? Uh, so, excuse me. Uh, so councilwoman holmer in, in our budget what we have right now is we have uh initially and that's a little bit ahead of the game but we, i'll uh, make sure we respond we have uh, gone through and had our budget meetings and one of the areas that we have talked about restoring was the funding for the arts and it would be on a going forward basis that next year uh, we would recommend bringing that forward at the million dollar level so that is not part of this funding uh, scenario though so uh, once again, if uh, the recommendation by uh, City Manager Israelson uh, and you're in favor of, please raise your hand. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Direction. Okay. Next item. Backyard chicken update. Jamie Cantrell, Director of Animal Services. Mayor and Council, we're seeking your direction on this as well. Uh, Mr. Cantrell has done some additional work um, and we have a presentation for you. Do you want me to do them first? Hmm? Okay. Mr. Cantrell? Yes, sir. Do you mind if I have these speakers go first and then you can uh, uh, kind of tell us about all the, the parameters that you have in store? It, it, it's y'all's meeting, so. I appreciate it. Let me, <laughs> let me do that real quick. Okay. Are you going to announce them? Lisa, thank you. The first speaker is Adam Sablich. Adam, if you don't mind, just uh, give us your name and where you live, your address, and uh, for the rest of the speakers, do the same. Thank sure. you. Adam Sablick, uh, Huntington Drive in Plano. Thank you. So, uh, Adam Sablick, Plano resident. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of the Plano Hens Action Team, which is a group, uh, mostly Facebook, uh, but people in the Plano area. Uh, I'm formerly from Richardson, where I did have a backyard flock. Um, myself and the rest of the group are hopeful that this council will finally be the ones who bring Plano's regulations in line with the neighboring cities, including Frisco, Dallas, and Richardson. Uh, we hope that the draft ordinance we provide gives a solid foundation for keeping re responsible backyard flocks. And most of all, we look forward to reduced government legislation that allows Plano residents the right to keep a reasonable number of chickens on their property. Our group found that there are over a thousand people who are interested in changing the legislation to allow backyard hens. Many don't even necessarily want chickens of their own, but they do agree that Plano residents should have the right to do so. Some appreciate free eggs, some enjoy visiting local coops, and others just like the idea of being a little bit more self-sustainable even though we're in an urban area. Our group has done quite a bit of research uh, on previously presented concerns such as noise, smell, disease, feral chickens, and increased predators. But fortunately, we can look at every surrounding city. No one considers Frisco, Dallas, or Richardson to be overrun with chickens. There's estimated fewer than 100 homes in each city that do keep a backyard flock, which is not really enough to be an issue. Additionally, HOAs and apartments will have already have restrictions that override the city regulations, which would limit this to homeowners with property that could support a flock. In 2020, our team provided a draft ordinance that addressed all these concerns. We support registration fees to offset some of the animal control costs. We agree that roosters should be disallowed, and we support making safety, security, and cleanliness a requirement of ownership. We found local vets that will treat birds and local businesses such as Wells Brothers that offer training resources and supplies. Personally, I used Wells Brothers when I had my flock in Richardson for all my feed and medical supplies, and I kind of really miss shopping there every couple weeks. They're awesome. Uh, so thank you for having me up here and taking the time to consider this issue. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, and I do have some copies of the draft ordinance if anyone would like one. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next speaker is Ember Chafin. Hello, my name is Ember Chafin. I live on Monaghan Court in Plano. Uh, we currently have uh, quite a large garden in our backyard. Um, just really wanting to share kind of the reason I would like chickens. Um, not only does it have to do with property rights, but with our garden, we actually produce a significant amount of uh, garden waste. And so one aspect of chickens that isn't always kind of thought about is the ability to really improve at home composting, as well as kind of driving down um, some of the items that you would typically throw away. Um, we do some other types of composting and I, I go to the environmental education center to drop off composting as well. Um, but lots of times I have, you know, maybe diseased plants or spoiled fruit um, that really I would like to be able to kind of uh, add into my uh, kind of regener regenerative uh, kind of backyard agriculture. So um, that is just what I'd like to share today. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Darla Green. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Darla Green. I live right over here in East Plano. Do y'all need an address? I just wanted to say I want to support the chickens because we have lived here for 31 years and I love Plano and I call it home and I want to continue to call it home, but I want to be able to have the property rights to be able to grow my own food if I want to. So thank you. Thank you very much. Brenda Seafi. Hi, I'm Brenda. I live on Roper Drive in Plano. Um, I have watched the Animal Services Director's presentation uh, presentations online over the past few uh, months. And I just want to preemptively refute uh, some of the issues mentioned in the presentation and give my opinion about what the real issue is about backyard chickens. Uh, when I called the animal services departments for the surrounding cities, cities last week, um, every one of them told me that chickens are not a big problem and that they were no worse than any other animal. Um, which should address any concerns about uh, captures, impounds, surrenders, and complaints mentioned in the presentation. Uh, none of these cities are complaining about feral populations either, which is why the examples that you will be shown of feral chickens are all in faraway places. Uh, in regard to salmonella, it's all about education and personal responsibility. Uh, we don't ban cats because people can get sick from toxoplasmosis, for example. Uh, as, um, and it's not a question of how few people want chickens either. Uh, in fact, the fewer people who are asking for them, the less of a problem it should be. Uh, as far as the expense, I would like to call to question the amount of money that's being requested. Uh, the $68,000 staff member the director's asking for is, is not an average officer. Um, at that pay grade, it's another senior position. And we already pay well over a million dollars per year in animal control staff wages alone. Um, also, Plano already has more animal control officers per 10,000 residents than almost every other neighboring city. So I don't see why we can't handle it. Um, if, if it's too expensive or it's too problematic for uh, us to add chickens to the mix, I would like to recommend uh, maybe outsourcing all of our animal services to the county. Uh, so in my mind, this is not a matter of the pros and cons of chickens or how many problems we might face. Uh, because I think there are manageable, uh, manageable solutions for every problem. Um, I think this is a matter of whether our government will uh, continue to restrict our freedom of choice and uh, impede on our personal pro uh, private property rights. So the people in plan are, are just asking for one simple freedom. Um, the role of a conservative government is to provide citizens with as many freedoms as possible and with f as few restrictions as possible. Um, none of our neighboring cities are complaining about chickens. And I would like to see this get done for the people who want it. Thank you. Thank you. Melody Sifi. Hi, I'm Melody. I also live on Roper Drive. Um, I just wanted to say that the citizens of Plano at least deserve the chance to decide for themselves whether they want to keep chickens on their property. Um, it's just one simple and very humble freedom for Plano citizens. Um, we've been delaying this situation for a long time, and I just ask that you guys would make a decision promptly um, and fight for our God-given freedoms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Kaylin Connors. Um, unfortunately, I have to follow those two. Um, uh, my name is Kalen Connors, uh, born and raised in Plano, uh, was over off Monaghan's uh, in, in south or central eastern Plano, that's what I like to call it. Um, I would like to come out in support of backyard chickens. Um, all of our neighboring cities have it. Um, I think it's, it's an odd request that, that we have to fight for um, routinely and for the last number of years uh, at a state level. Uh, there's been legislation that was being pushed to uh, to allow this to happen. I'm not asking that we step on top of HOA or apartment city rights, but uh, I do think that we should be able to, um, you know, be more in line and more self-sufficient uh, with our neighboring cities. Uh, you know, as far as I can, I, I can't, I can't think of a single city that doesn't allow them. Uh, but that's that's what I got. Uh, so, um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Cantrell, thank you.
Got it. You're going to have to rescue me on this one. Very good. Yep. Okay, um, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. I'm Jamie Cantrell. I'm the uh, Animal Services Director for the City of Plano. Um, very briefly, this is the third time that we have come um, recently to speak with council uh, about this issue. Um, for those of you who are new to the council, I included all of the previous slides um, in your packet, so I'm not going to go over that whole presentation, so uh, we won't need the full 30 minutes just for me. Um, but uh, if anyone has specific questions about something that was previously provided, then I can, we'll be happy to, to, to try to answer that. Um, we also, as was mentioned by one of the speakers, there was a, a house bill that was proposed that would have uh, prevented a municipality from adopting an ordinance that would um, prohibit the keeping of, of six or fewer domestic fowl on any single residential lot, a single family residential lot. That did not pass um, in the legislature. So uh, currently our restrictions in Plano are that um, uh, livestock is allowed on agricultural and estate development designations. Um, those properties both have to have nearly two acres if you want to have livestock animals. Uh, curiously, estate development, you're allowed to have a horse, um, cattle, llamas, all of those types of animals, but you're not, it's specifically not allowed to have uh, any sort of swine or fowl um, on the property. Um, uh, and there is a, a note in our zoning ordinance that says that, that it's anticipated that all agricult agricultural districts will be changed to other zoning classifications as the city continues to fully develop. Um, in our animal ordinances, we have livestock. Um, it, it means any animal that's typically kept to provide food or fiber, including chickens, ducks, and other fowl. Um, so it's not just chickens that would be in there that are, are considered pretty much any bird that you would, you would keep for um, food uh, uh, purposes. Uh, quail, pheasants, things like that would all be considered fowl. Um, you can only keep livestock in according to the zoning ordinances. That's all that we have in our animal services ordinances, basically. Um, and you can't create any sort of odor or noise that uh, disturbs anyone uh, living nearby who has reasonable sensibilities. Um, and you also have to dispose of any excrement um, to prevent those odors from being, uh, uh, if, if, even if you do have an agricultural property. Um, for us, you can see here, these are the numbers of chickens that we deal with this year alone um, since October 1 uh, through, as you can see there, June 22nd. We've taken in 24 chickens so far this year. Um, 11 of those were at large, 13 of them were surrendered by their owners. So even though they are not um, legal in most parts of the city, we still deal with quite a few chickens on a uh, annual basis. Uh, really at this point, we have um, uh, given our recommendations on what we would, uh, what we would, I guess, recommend to the council. Um, uh, we have addressed additional resources. Um, you know, I have done a lot of research. I've done a lot of, of talking to community groups, to business owners, things like that, um, as far as what would they would like to see happen if we were to go in that direction. Um, really for us, we're just wanting to know what direction does the council want to go. Um, you know, we can have a, a ordinance put in place that we feel would be reasonable, not only for those people who want to own um, uh, chickens, but also for those people who live next door to them that do not want to have chickens. And I think that that's what we try to make people understand is that I work for people who don't own pets just as much as I work for those who do own pets. So uh, we want to keep everyone's rights and everyone's responsibilities um, taken care of and provided for in our ordinances. And we just really want to know if that's the direction council wants to take, then, you know, we can we can make that happen. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If there's directions and we'll be happy to, to go that way as well. All right. Thank you. Count Councilwoman G uh, Homer. Yes, I'm curious, what do you do currently do with the chickens that you that are surrendered or taken in? We, they're no different than any other animal. We try to find them a new home that's appropriate for them. Um, right now, we have places outside of Plano that we, you know, will we'll try to rehome them with different uh, 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 people, groups, things like that. Um, but for us, really, any animal we take into, we're going to try to find it a, an appropriate home. If it's a wild animal, 
as long as it's healthy, we're going to take it back. If it's a dog or a cat, we want to find it a home that, that's going to take care of it for the rest of its life. So are you currently working with Plano Hens, the gentleman that started the group? Um, working with them in, in what, to, what capacity? To find new homes for the chickens. I don't know if any of them have ever adopted. I mean, we don't adopt, we wouldn't adopt a chicken out to someone who lives in Plano unless they were in an agricultural property oh. and could legally ha hold them. Because that is one thing. We're not going to give an animal to a a... a home that we know it's illegal for them to possess it there. I understand. I just yeah. thought since there's already an organization within Plano, they probably have a lot of connections with people that would want Yeah, to and, and we, we, we do have connections with things to be able to try to find them home. Thankfully, it hasn't been overwhelming to us. Um, you know, really the way that we tend to get them is in a small batch. It may be one or two to three at a time. It's not normally where I get 30 of them all at once. Um, cause that would be a little more difficult. So smaller numbers you can tend to handle. It's those, if you get work to get a big number all at once is where it could, could really be a drain on resources. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, mayor. I just had a question. That's probably more a question for Mark because it's about the new position uh, that'll be coming forward in the budget. And I just wanted to follow up on a conversation that Mark and I had Th this position is, is going to be necessary with or without backyard hens. If I'm understanding correctly, there is additional work workflow from backyard hens but it's it's not responsible for an entire position jamie and his staff are some of the hardest working staff members we have and so have adding a, an additional uh, animal services officer to jamie's workload which has been increasing every year since i've known him and worked closely with him uh the the number of calls we have are increasing so it is not being driven by but will help respond to um, that uh, this situation and, and if I may, one point of clarification from what was said earlier, if you compare our officer positions to other cities, you probably will see that we have more officer positions. The reason for that is that my officers do everything. In most other cities, an officer is the one that drives a truck out in the field. For us, our officers are cleaning the shelter on a daily basis. They're answering the phones. They are dispatching. They're uh, uh, assisting the people that come into the facility. I don't have just field officers. I have people, animal services officers, who do everything for us. And that's the reason why we have more officers um, than what you may see comparably with other cities. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. I don't have a question. I was just going to make oh. a comment. Do you want to wait? Maybe do you have wait. a question? Yes. Um, I want to see, uh, out of the various groups that you look to to rehome these chickens that you uh, take in, um, how extensively do you work with Cullen County uh, Animal Services? Um, we work very well with Collin County. Um, I can't tell you that we have to call them every time that we have a, a chicken or anything like that. I know the, the director there, um, Misty, on a first name basis, and he can email her and, or call her at the drop of a hat if we need something, just like they call us if they need something from us. So, um, you know, we do have a very good working relationship. I can't tell you that how many chickens they have assisted with over the years. I, I don't, we don't really, I don't really track the numbers that way. Okay. It was actually the conversation I had a a couple of years ago with Misty that I was thinking of, she said that uh, at the county level, they get very frequent, like almost daily requests for uh, chickens, uh, mainly from the more rural parts. But uh, so I was wondering how um, how easy it is to contact them um, two years since I had that discussion uh, for these 24 or so chickens that we've taken in, yeah. in the past year. Like I said, we have a very good working relationship. We have to really be careful and walk a fine line whenever it comes to animals that we take into our shelter because you have a group of people who would think that no matter what type of animal it is if it comes into our hands we shouldn't place it into a home that's going to do anything other than take care of it for the rest of its life it's natural life right um and so we have to be very careful with with what we do and and, and who may be requesting certain animals understood okay so I'll just, I guess, start the discussion amongst us. Um, I'm in, in support of us doing this um, largely because of the property rights issue and because the majority of our uh, surrounding cities are doing this. And I think that, um, you know, if everybody else can do it, that, you know, we're the city of excellence, I think we can find a way of doing it in an excellent way as well. I'll say as far as bringing an ordinance back, um, 
I would love for um, the city to work closely with the um, you know leaders from the Plano Hens group since they're the ones passionate about it. But I think um, you know we've done a lot of other animals. I, I don't want us to see us put a lot of extra restrictions on hen owners that we wouldn't put on a dog owner, a cat owner, or things like that. I think it should be similar. Um, obviously, not um, requ you know, not allowing the roosters, things like that, I think is great. And that there's reasonable ways that we can limit the um, the flock size and things like that. And, you know, requiring a permit like we would for a dog or cat, I think that's reasonable too. But I just want to make sure it's not overly burdensome for a hen owner, like it would be for a, a dog or cat owner. So those are my main thoughts. Okay. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> echo the Mayor Pro Tem's direction. Uh, I'm strongly in support of allowing uh, backyard hens, uh, not roosters, uh, of course, uh, but backyard hens. I think permitting and other requirements that, that are applied to other types of animals within the city make sense. But, but as the mayor pro tem said, wouldn't want to see overly onerous restrictions um, on, on backyard hens. And I, I think the fact that other cities are doing it is, is a key factor for me as well. You know, it's, it's something that has been done successfully elsewhere and so uh, like the mayor pro tem i believe that the city of excellence can do it so we have uh we have an opportunity to to have them uh develop an ordinance for us to look at uh, uh in the future meeting and if everybody's in favor of uh, seeing that to go move forward please raise your hand okay we have direction and Jamie's been working on an ordinance actually uh, for the last several weeks, um, putting things together. We will make sure, I know that we've already engaged somewhat uh, publicly with that ordinance. We will make sure we do so uh, and bring that back uh, to council uh, as soon as we're possible. So thank you very much, thank Jamie. You. Thank you. Our next item is uh, item eight, legislative update. Brandy Youngkin, Director of Policy and Government Relations. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Brandi Youngkin. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations. I'm going to give you a legislative report. I won't say final report because there may be two special sessions, but keep our fingers crossed. The, um, we started the session um, in October with pre-filing, and uh, the 87th legislative session adjourned sine die on Monday, May 31st. The total number of bills uh, that were filed uh, were over 6,000, and that doesn't include like um, the House and Senate and joint resolutions, that's just bills. And then I put the other number, there were 1,518 that were city related to the, the, the city was looking at. Um, the House and Senate sent over 1,000 bills and resolutions for, the go for Governor Abbott to sign. The governor had until June 20th to veto a bill, sign it, or let it become law by inaction. And the governor vetoed about 20 bills. So the total bills that passed, meaning that he signed or let, uh, didn't veto, was about um, 1,073. And of those that passed, it was about 269 that the departments looked at to see, hey, will this will affect the city. The good news is, I'm only going to touch on about 17 tonight. So of all of that, that's where we're getting down there. Um, and like I said, the departments have reviewed all those bills that have passed, and they're continuing to review them for the policies and procedures to ensure that the, the new laws are implemented. So what I'm, if I'm bringing them up tonight, it's because the department said, hey, we want the council to know about them, or they may be coming back for an ordinance change. Um, I did mention the July special session. Uh, the, it was June 22nd, Governor Abbott announced that he will call a special session uh, beginning July 8th, and that, that session can last 30 days. 
Um, he hasn't announced what all issues will be considered, but the main topic is election integrity, uh, Senate Bill 7, possibly could include bail reform. Um, it's expected that he'll issue an official proclamation this week that says what those are. Um, and then the last thing on there, uh, oh, the September, um, they're looking at doing another special session in September regarding redistricting. Um, and then right now, all the House and Senate um, staff, uh, the legislators can submit any interim charges to the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker. We, specifically for the City of Plano, we don't have anything to bring up right now, but if that's something, then um, we'll reach out to the subcommittee to talk about that. Okay, so like as I said, we have about 17 bills and this first one, House Bill 9, is a police-related bill. And again, it's not that there's an issue with the bill. The police department just asked that I bring it to your attention. It goes into effect September 1st and it's about um, blocking an intersection. Just increases the penalty for an offense if you're obstructing a highway. Um, if the uh, individual or individuals um, prevent the passage of an authorized emergency vehicle or obstruct access to a hospital. The next one, House Bill 1082, um, is regarding the, uh, for elected officials, it, it just added elected, local elected officials um, so that your personal information can be accepted um, from the Public Information Act. So home address, home telephone number, um, things like that, uh, regardless of whether you comply with any requirement to keep it confidential. So it just switches it to it being automatic. Um, and then if you want to turn any information over, you would let the city secretary know. Also, there is a, a something in there that says you can choose to restrict the public access to certain information and appraisal records. The next bill, um, House Bill 1475, um, this is um, regarding the Board of Adjustment and our building official, Celso Mata, is looking at this and this may be one that comes back. Um, it just uh, adds considerations for the Board of Adjustment to determine whether to grant or deny a variance. It um, just expands the definition for an unnecessary hardship. And there are five things listed there um, that could qualify for an unnecessary hardship. Whether the financial cost of compliance is greater than 50% of appraised value, whether compliance would result in a loss to the, to the lot of at least 25% of the area where the development will occur, whether compliance would conflict with the city ordinance or others, and whether compliance would result in encroachment on adjacent property, or whether the city uh, considers the structure to be non-conforming. So again, uh, our building official may come back. Uh, and this one is effective September 1st. The next one, next one House Bill 1869, um, it just redefines what uh, it qualifies as debt that is calculated um, on that is not part of on the MNO side. And so when this bill was originally filed, um, the only thing that would be in included was it had to be um, through an election, a bond through an election. All of these different items that were included in here. So now all of these different things now um, meet the definition of a debt. If it's approved at an election, if it's self-supporting, if it's a state or federal loan, and then the designated infra infrastructure. So if you're taking out debt for anything that's included in, in these lists, um, then it would still, it would not move over to the MNO. And then also refunding bonds and um, TERS um, bonds. The next one is House Bill 1900. This is also uh, police related and budget related. This was, um, if you heard about it during session, was called the defunding bill. Um, it, you can see there that it says it only applies to a population over 250,000. So that's about 11 cities um, in Texas, Plano being one of them. And then it um, also allows the state to withhold sales tax collected by a defunding city and give it to the Texas Department of Public Safety to pay for the cost of state resources to protect residents of a defunded city. This isn't something that the police or budget has um, an issue in as we're going through the budget uh, cycle, you'll see that. It's just something they wanted to make you aware of. Also, Collin County is included in that as a separate bill, Senate Bill 23 for those counties over 1 million population, they were included as well. The next bill is House Bill 1925, um, and it bans homeless encampment statewide. Um, we have a group of multiple departments that are working on this issue. As I know you're aware, we have their neighborhood services, police department, um, and others. And so they will come back to you with more information on this. 
Um, the next one, House Bill 1927, allows for permitless carry for those over 21, um, as long as there's not some other reason for them to be excluded from federal state law. The next one is House Bill 2073. And this is just another one that we're bringing it to your attention because it requires a policy, a paid quarantine leave policy. Um, and so that's something that HR is working on with, with um, the fire department and police department. And that may be something that is brought back. The next one is House Bill 2366. This is police related and it's just um, another one to let you know of. It increases the offense for using lasers or fireworks against police, firefighters, or other cities, uh, employees in uniform, their safety officers. The next one is House Bill 2404. And you can see it says that the re it requires the comptroller to create a database of all local chapter 380 agreements. But in order for the comptroller to um, create that database, we need to turn over all of our 380 agreements. So currently we do have them, they're approved by council, so they're public, but we're just bringing it to your attention that it's gonna take a change in how we submit this and in information to the comptroller's office. And also to point out that it doesn't apply to all cities, not 4A, 4B, just um, um, us, there. We, we do 380 agreements. Um, the next one, House Bill 3712. This is one that the police department, again, there's not really an issue. It's just saying that they need to take a look at their training and ensure that they are in compliance with their basic peace officer training course, that they're doing it in the way that this bill lays out. And the next one is House Bill 4110. Um, the reason I'm bringing this one up is um, it was a, a Plano police officer and his investigation that brought this to the attention and it's Representative Leach that filed it about this issue. You may have heard of it in, in the news or in the past, but I just wanted to say this is from a, you know, the origination of the investigation from a Plano police officer. The next one is Senate Bill 22. And again, it's just for your information that it adds um, COVID-19 to the list of um, disease presumptions. Uh, the next one is Senate Bill 69, and it says that a peace officer has the duty to intervene, stop, or prevent another peace officer from using force. This is one that the, they're just, the police department's confirming that they're training, everything is, um, uh, they're following this bill. And the next one, Senate Bill 219. This is one that I know the legislative committee is aware of. Um, this is, if you think of it like a triangle, you have the architect, the designer, the contractor, the builder, and then the city as the owner. And for that responsibility on if there were a defect, it's just removing that responsibility from the contractors. So the different departments that talked about this, engineering facilities, public works, purchasing, they're discussing with risk and legal regarding if there's any need to increase our, our insurance policies on these projects. So I'm just bringing it to your attention for that reason. The next one is Senate Bill 1116, and it requires the city to post election results on our website, which we do. Um, we're just going to make sure that we're going to, it may look different. We're going to tweak the way that information to make it fit how they want us to show it in this bill. The next one is Senate Bill 1585, um, and this one is, yeah, the city, uh, this is one that the um, Heritage Commission, they're working on. I think they're going to be talking to um, their commission. Maybe it's tomorrow than this week about this. But they're just, they may be back for a um, policy or ordinance change on this one. So those are all of the bills that we wanted to bring up to your attention. It's mostly because of coming back and you may see something in an ordinance change. Um, the only thing I wanted to say is thank you to the legislative subcommittee and to council for your work and direction this session and to the city manager and deputy city manager Russian and the directors for the communication of how we uh, went about it. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and then also Stephen and I, uh, the, our legislative uh, analyst will continue to watch all the bills and update you as necessary throughout interim even. Thank you. Any questions for Brandon? Thank you very much. Our next item is uh, consent and regular agendas. Uh, we did have two citizens request um, items to be removed for individual consideration, item E and item H.
Anything else? Next item is uh, council items for discussion for future agendas. Uh, I'd like to uh, put a discussion of uh, council rules of procedure on a future agenda uh, whenever the timing's right. Okay. Anything else? Mayor and Council, I did talk with Councilman Williams about bringing back a, a previous item that we had had and has been postponed for some time, which was the te uh, possible Texas Independence Day festival uh, or event. Uh, that will be coming back as part of your budget discussion when you have your budget work session on that Saturday. So we'll be adding that to that agenda. So it's, while it's not a council agenda, I wanted to inform you that it would be discussed. Yeah, do, um, for the rules of procedure, uh, I need a second for that. Do you have that? Second. Okay, thank oh, you. Wait, 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 I didn't understand it. So, Anthony, can you explain to me what, what is it that you're asking? So we had a previous discussion about our, our council rules of procedure uh, and, I, you know, as, as you may remember, there was some confusion about whether we came out of that with rules of procedure uh, for the council's uh, operations, you know, not necessarily parliamentary rules of procedure, but just rules to help us function effectively um, and provide guidance on, on procedure for our discussions on the dais. And uh, we've, we've had a couple of previous discussions about that. And basically the, the last thing that came out was let's wait until after the election so that, you know, whatever the membership is of the council for the next two years can decide to. I remember now. Okay. Perfect. Right. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> Shelby, Shelby, second. Okay. We're going to take a recess and return uh, in five minutes. Okay. So we're going to move along real quick.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvening in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Council Member Grady, I mean, excuse me, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge by Council Member Grady. Would you all please stand? Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you um, for this week as we celebrate the 4th of July. We thank you for this wonderful country and city that we have the opportunity to live in. We thank you for the many freedoms that we get to enjoy. And we pray that as we celebrate that you will keep every one of our citizens safe that you will be with all those who are traveling or just being locally with family and friends, that everyone will be safe and that you'll be with our first responders as they're here helping to keep us safe. Thank you, Lord, for blessing this meeting tonight. Help us to make good decisions for our city and help us to always do things that are in the best interest of everyone in our community. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if we please lay a place that our Face the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. I was told not to get close to this mic. Okay. So tonight we're recognizing the Plano West High School Wrestling State Champions. Councilman uh, Williams and I had the honor of being at the high school the other night and uh, were able to uh, celebrate with you guys. But we really wanted you to come to the council chambers so we could do it uh, officially. And so I'd like to ask Jeff Smith, the PISD Athletic Director, to come forward. Dr. Teresa Williams, PISD's Chief Operating Officer. Clay Goodlow, Plano West High School Wrestling Head Coach. Ashley Leakes, 2019 state champion and first female PISD wrestling champion. Yeah. Tegan Jameson, 2019-2021 state champion, first male state champ in PISD history, 2020 state runner-up, and now the 2021 state champion. Currently ranked 15th in the nation, he will be wrestling for Minnesota. Come on up, Tegan. <laughs> Devin Patton, 2020 state champ and 2021 state runner-up, All-American wrestler. She's going to Texas Wesleyan in the fall. Congratulations. <laughs> and not able to join us tonight is uh, Lilani Hernandez. Is that right? I want to make sure you're not here. 2020 state champion, All-American wrestler, and going to Texas Wesleyan University wrestling in the fall. I'll ask Coach Goodlow to give her this certificate. Also here tonight is Fareed Mubarak, who has been a state runner-up two years in a row, and he'll be a senior this fall. We'll be cheering you on, my friend, this coming season. Please join me in applauding this great group of kids that are just amazing, and we're really proud of you. Now, I'd like all the families to come up. We're going to all take a picture. Ashley, here you go. Devin, get these right. Tegan, and Leilani. There you go. And we'll have yours next, this, next this coming year. All right. Here we go. Let's take a pick. Everybody, everybody get in here. Yeah. There you go. 
No, you're fine. You're fine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, all right. All right. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Good seeing you. Yeah, Beth. My pleasure. So July is Parks and Recreation Month, and I'd like to call up Ron Smith, Director of our Parks and Recreation, and Kelly Kremens, Community Outreach Specialist. This being the uh, Parks and Recreation Month, I'm going to read the uh, proclamation. So whereas Parks and Rec programs are the integral part of the communities throughout this country, including the city of Plano, and whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens, and contributing to the economic, environmental well-being in community and region. Whereas parks, natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe. Whereas parks and natural recreation areas ensure ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children, adults to connect with nature and, and the outdoors. Whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has de designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, now I therefore John B. Munns, Mayor of the City of Plano, do hereby proclaim July 2021 as Parks and Recreation Month in Plano. And I do hereby encourage all citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in acknowledging the importance of our parks and recreation facilities. We thank the Parks and Recreation Department and urge everyone to enjoy the department it has to offer. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. No, come on. Open it. Yeah, let's, let's get it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Tyler, are you here? Tyler Moore? Well, we have a certificate of appreciation for Tyler Moore from the Heritage Commission. And Plano's fortunate to have citizens who are glad to volunteer and support our boards and commissions of our city. And we thank you for your time and efforts, and we'll get this to you. Thank you again, Tyler, for your service here to the city of Plano. Thank you very much. Comments. Okay. Sorry. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items, but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And I do have two speakers this evening. The first one is Cassandra Bull. Good evening, City Council. My name is Cassandra Bull, and I live on Sonora Drive. Um, the topic I bring to you tonight is the availability of the Rawlinson Natatorium for public recreation. Of course, last summer was an anomaly, and I understand that it was closed. Summer of 2019, the facility was open Saturday and Sunday, 1 to 5 p.m., with free entrance. In 2018, a nominal $2 fee was charged. 
Now the facility is not open to the public at all. The Oak Point Recreation Center outdoor pool is closed this season. I bring this to the City Council because the upkeep and availability of the natatorium hasn't been much of a priority. In May, a very small percentage of Plano residents approved a $364 million bond package and the passage of Proposition C awarded $15.9 million for upgrades to the Tom Mullenbeck Recreation Center. During the budget deliberations for 2022, please consider an influx of funds to update the aged aquatic facility. An upgrade would provide some summertime recreation options for East Plano, and I sure would like to enjoy some lap swimming there again. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Kenneth Wilson. Mr. Wilson. All right. I guess that's it. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Yes. Uh, a quick follow up question regarding um, Ms. Bull's question regarding the natatorium. Um, I may be imagining this, but I thought there was a, uh, a change of ownership of the natatorium within the past year or two. Um, am I imagining that? So, Councilman, I, I don't believe that there's been a, a change, but we have discussed with PISD <clears throat> that aspect. We will provide a briefing to uh, from Parks to City Council on that, that item, and we'll circle back with Ms. Bowles on that as well. Thank you. Move on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Thank you. Is there a motion for the <laughs> remainder of the consent agenda with the exception of items E and H? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of E and H. Please vote. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Sorry. Yeah, right. Motion passes eight to zero. Item E. To approve the purchase of furniture for the High Point North Maintenance Facility for the Facilities Department in the amount of $118,496 from Facilitech Inc. Doing, bus doing business as business interiors throughout, through an existing contract and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Ron Smith, your Parks and Recreation Director, here to answer any questions you have on item E. I think we have a speaker for that item. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Kimberly Sinho. It looks like they did not appear. Hmm. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve uh, item E in the consent agenda. Please vote. Thank you, Rick. Motion passes eight to zero. Item H, to approve an increase to the current awarded, awarded contract amount of $6,373,251 by $1,500,000 for a total contract amount of $7,800,000. $73,251 for arterial pavement repair, Coit Road, Parker Road to SH-121 project from Jim Bowman Construction Company LP for the Public Works Department and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. I'm Jerry Cosgrove, Director of Public Works. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Jerry. We have a speaker for item H. We do, uh, Ms. Bull. Good evening. Um, one, 
two more minutes of your time. I'm just curious about this 24% increase in cost. Um, um, $1.5 million is a lot of money. Um, that's my only thing is if we can kind of find out why in two years it's gone up 25, 24%. Thank you. Thank you. Basically, this change order uh, result has resulted from two different items. One being the inventory was done in the spring of 2019, now being two years later. We're finding more things that are, have broken since then. Also, we've had an opportunity available to us that wasn't there when we bid the project out. Since we bid the project out, the engineering department has bid out the intersection projects on Parker Road and on Park Boulevard. Both of them involve intersections at Coit, at both locations. And that happens to be that the contractor on those other two projects is the contractor on our project. So we're able to coordinate better getting improvements done. So we have actually extended the project. Originally started at Parker Road. We're going to go all the way down to Park Boulevard. That way there, we can take care of it all at the same time with the same contractor. Don't have to worry about traffic control or anything like that because it's all under one contractor. About a million dollars is for that extension. A half million dollars, again, approximately, is for quantities that have risen since we started the original project. Again, trying to take advantage of an opportunity here that normally we don't have. And Mr. Cosgrove, this will be an overlay project at some point in the yes. future as well. Yes, uh, we are preparing plans right now that once this gets done, this will be uh, probably two or three locations will keep it combined together for an overlay project. And that's one of the main reasons why we're extending it south. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll move to approve. Thank you. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Whoop. <laughs> Wrong. Second. <laughs> okay. I have a motion and a second to approve uh, the consent agenda item H. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Rick voted. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with five minutes with five minutes for rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to accept and approve a service and assessment plan and assessment role for the Collin Creek East Public Improvement District, making a finding of special benefit to the property in the district, levying assessments against property within the district, and establishing a lien on such property, providing for the method of assessment and paying the uh, payment of the assessments in accordance with Chapter 372, Texas Local Government Code as amended, providing penalties and interest on delinquent assessments, providing for se severability, resolving matters incident and related thereto, and providing an effective date. Good evening, Council. Peter Braster, Director of Special Projects. Uh, this item uh, is um, unfortunately not ready for your action tonight, so we respectfully um, request that you open the public hearing and then table it to the July 26th meeting. This is necessary because we did advertise it, so we're going through the process. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, it's been requested to table, so I'll close the public hearing. No. <laughs> Leave it open. All right. <laughs> motion to do I have a motion to table? Motion to table to July twenty sixth. Second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion to table. Uh, item number one. Please vote. Thank you, Rick. Motion passes eight to zero. Next item. 
Item number two, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to accept and approve a service and assessment plan and assessment role for the Collin Creek West Public Improvement District, making a finding of special benefit to the property in the district, levying assessments against property within the district and establishing a lien on such property, providing for the method of assessment and the payment of the assessments in accordance with Chapter 372, Texas Local Government Code as amended, providing penalties and interest on delinquent assessments, providing for severability, resolving matters incident and related thereto, and providing an effective date. Good evening. As like the East, this is now the other half, the West, and we respectfully ask the same thing, which is to open the public hearing and then table it to the <clears throat> July 26th meeting. Thank you. There's been a request to table a motion. I thought I already had it open. We'll open the public hearing. Motion to table to July 26th. Second. Thank you. I have a motion to table item number two. Please vote. Thank you, Rick. Motion passes eight to zero to table item uh, number two. Thank you. Next item. Item number three. Public hearing and consideration of an appeal of the Planning and Zoning Commission's denial of zoning case 2021-003 and concept plan 2021-001, requesting to rezone 19.1 acres located at the southwest corner of Plano Parkway and Executive Drive from Corridor Commercial to Planned Development Corridor Commercial zoned corridor commercial and located within the I-9, or excuse me, 190 Tollway Plano Parkway Overlay District. Applicant on, a, on a property owner LLC uh, care of Bay West Development. Good evening. I will get the presentation started here momentarily. I think it's working. I'm going to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am Christina Day, Director of Planning, and this item is requested for withdrawal. I'm available for questions that you might have regarding the request. Thanks. Any questions? I'll open the public hearing been a request to withdraw. Do I hear a motion? Motion to uh, for the withdrawal. <laughs> which, which one? The one before? No, this one. There, oh, there are no speakers on this item, but we'll need to close it now. Okay. All right. Huh? Close it now? We haven't made a motion. This Close. is different than the ones previous. Okay, excuse me. My my mistake. I'm learning. We'll close the public hearing. I'll make a motion for a, to approve the withdrawal. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to uh, approve the request for withdrawal for item number three. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Item number four, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2021-008 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended. So as to amend plan development 94 retail on 2.2 acres of land located at the northeast corner of 15th Street and Greenway Drive in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, to allow restaurant cafeteria as permitted uses and to modify development standards which may include, but are not limited to, parking. Directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Applicant Greenway Village, LTD. 
Right. This app, the applicant is requesting to table this request due to a uh, technical, for technical reason, to July the 26th. I'm available for questions you might have on this item. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. That's what it says. <laughs> Am I right? Mm -hmm. Or wrong again? No, oh, you can you can open and close the public hearing. And I, yeah, I, okay. okay. <laughs> we can do this like that. And I'll close it. <laughs> motion to table the July twenty sixth. Second that motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to table uh, item number four. Please vote. Thank you, Rick. Motion passes eight to zero. Next item. Item number five, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2021-007 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended. So as to rezone 1.5 acres of land located at the Northwest corner of Turtle Creek Drive and Old Westbury Lane in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, from planned development 342 single family residence nine to planned development 423 patio home, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Applicant Shattuck Acquisitions LLC. All right, as stated previously, this is zoning case 2021-07, and it is a request to rezone a portion of a lot that is currently split zoned uh, by two plan development districts. The western portion is a plan development number 423, <clears throat> and has a base zoning of patio home. The eastern portion is a plan development number 342 with a single family nine base zoning. The lot is consistently zoned with a specific use permit number 58 for country club and private club. The applicant is requesting to rezone the eastern portion of the property to make it consistent with the western portion of the property allowing patio home zoning standards modified by the PD standards across the entire 3.1 acres. The graphic on this graphic shows the two notice boundaries, both in blue, the 200 foot notice requirement uh, by state law, and in red, the 500 foot notice requirement under the city's ordinance. It also includes all the zoning districts um, both on the property itself as well as the surrounding zoning within the neighborhood area. This shows you the development pattern via aerial photography. So you can see the property is developed with amenities uh, such as tennis courts and the surrounding residential development forms including townhouses, patio homes, and detached single-family housing. So this is the associated concept plan that's been submitted as part of the zoning case. That The dashed line indicates the boundaries of the parcel, although it is not indicative of the boundaries of the zoning case. It's the full parcel that would be developed um, if the zoning case were to be approved or perhaps even if the zoning case were not approved. So the plan development district that is being requested has some specific stipulations and I wanted to run through those to show you how they impact the zoning. The lot size of the patio home district is actually increased uh, by this plan development district. It requires a minimum lot size of 5,500 square feet so it's more akin to our single family six zoning in the lot size than a typical patio home lot, which is 4,000 square feet minimum. And the lot width is also a 25% increase requiring a 50 foot lot width 
versus 40 feet. That's our standard patio home lot width. There's also no requirement for open space within this patio home district as it stands today. The comprehensive plan is actually pretty interesting in this area. If you look at the future land use map, it shows this area as major public and semi-public, which indicates it's an area for large schools, universities, golf courses, things along these lines. So I don't believe that really represents the area as it's developed today, but I think it may be a throwback to prior years, decades in the past, when it used to be polo fields. So I think it's actually more representative of a past development pattern than the current development form that you see in, this, in the city. But the, the city's language in the comprehensive plan does adequately support this zoning request. Uh, it makes comments such as the city seeks attractive, inclusive, cohesive residential neighborhoods with a mix of housing. The infill policy statement talks specifically about infill on vacant or redevelopment of existing sites surrounded by other improved properties. Also, the housing <coughs> report specifically addresses uh, this type of existing housing stock and available land um, being a fit for patio home development. So uh, we believe that the policy statements are, are a better fit than the land use map. You can see the neighborhood compatibility if you look at the existing development pattern uh, versus the, the this specific site. So you can see the site outlined in the kind of red and white dashed line. Um, and then this is kind of a classic Plano neighborhood development pattern where you see there is higher density as you move toward the corner of Parkwood and Park Boulevard, office on the corner, townhomes, which are more intensive residential development, patio homes are the transition, and then single family nine homes as you move to the interior of the neighborhood. So the transition there being uh, the street, which I have the street name written down, which um, Old Westbury Lane, uh, because it's not marked on the aerial, you can't see it, but that's the eastern edge of the property. That is the transition there to the north between patio homes and SF9 homes, so that would just continue, if the zoning case were approved, it would just continue that transition of land use. So the existing site is a private recreate, it's developed as a private recreation facility uh, with tennis courts, clubhouse, the swimming pool has been filled in, um, and a vacant building. It is no longer currently in use. It's been sold uh, by its previous owner, uh, but does have the existing SUP for country club and private club. The Planning and Zoning Commission uh, did make a recommendation of approval by a vote of eight to zero, but they added a stipulation. There was quite a bit of discussion at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting about the impact to adjacent properties. And as a outcome of that discussion, they suggested adding this fourth stipulation regarding landscape easements on the north and south sides of the property. So that's the language that you see before you on this slide. The zoning case responses, you see we have quite a number of responses. Um, they're really the majority of property owners within the 200 uh, foot boundary have responded. Um, and really a fairly even split between support and opposition um, with one owner remaining neutral um, within the response boundary. However, it did not meet the threshold for a super majority vote at city council. Then as you expand out into the city at large, we have more responses. We had quite a number of duplicate responses um, and households that replied, replied with multiple responses, um, 32 total unique responses from property owners and a letter from the homeowners association. So this is a citywide view of responses. So that is the end of my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions the council might have on this case. 
Thank you. Any questions for staff? Mayor Broto? Can you go back to the um, stipulation that PNC added? Just put it the up stipulation, on the screen. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, I do, can you just leave? Sure, absolutely. Councilman Gray. Um, just going to get a clarification here, Ms. Day. Um, on the northern side of this property uh, is what? To the north of this property is a patio home development with the plan development district. Okay, and the patio homes also extend on the west side of the property? They're also on the west side of the So property. the single family is really extending on the south side and the east side of the property? That is correct. Um, and the transition between the single family attached and the single family um, is the patio homes? That is correct. Okay, and so they're pretty prevalent in this area already? Um, they are. There is a, the patio home subdivision runs between the townhouses and um you know, I don't know the exact number of units, but they are there is a significant number. So the only thing that we're seeking here tonight um, is a, approval of getting the uh, one portion of the property rezoned so that it's consistent with the western side of that property. It appears to me on the map that that is about maybe 30%, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the property is zoned single family where about 60 to 70% is already zoned as patio home. Is that about correct? The numbers we have, um, is, it, that's probably a good ballpark. Um, the zoning boundaries take in the right of way, so it kind of skews our perception. It's 1.5 acres is what we have, and the parcel itself is 3.1. So, um, you know, I think that but that doesn't include the right of way, so I think that's probably an accurate estimate. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, can you go back to a map? I'm having trouble visualizing what they're trying to achieve mm -hmm. on their stipulation. Sure, let me try to find the um, where we've got the, the site plan. I think it's back here. So the issue, and this may be best covered by the uh, applicant who is available to speak and has a presentation for you. It's really on the northern side on Castlegate Drive. And I'll see if I can, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to have a mouse here to help me, maybe. Ah, can you all see that? Oh, probably not. Anyway, on the northern side on Castlegate Drive, uh, there were concerns about the neighbors about the kind of impact and visibility of the side yards, essentially of the northernmost lots. Similarly, on the south side of the side yards, of seeing the side yards uh, from, because those houses, especially on the south along Turtle Creek Drive, they face onto Cur Turtle Creek Drive and then they're gonna be looking at people's side yards. So the negotiation there from the developer was that that would be a lushly landscaped side yard that there would be they would either be maintained by the homeowners association if they got accepted into the homeowners association or it would be a landscape easement that would be restricted and maintained by that homeowner um, so they're dedicating a landscape easement there to ensure that there is a substantial amount of landscaping in those side yards Any other questions for staff? Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry, I did, I did have sorry. one. Thank you, Mayor. So I saw uh, a discussion about uh, concerns about generating additional on-street parking in uh, one or more of the responses in opposition that we received in our uh, the, the response packet this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, does staff feel that there will be significant additional on-street parking, um, you know, for example, on uh, Old Westbury or, or any of the other streets bordering this development uh, if it's approved? Right. I think with the number of units that are proposed and with the amount of frontage that exists with a 50-foot wide lot and the fact that they're rear entry, you're going to have the, all of the street frontage that's available for parking. Shattuck Boulevard is a 
has additional width. It's not a standard street width, so there's additional space or width that allows parking there. Um, you also have the end caps, essentially, that do not have any houses that front them, essentially, so those are good places to park. So I think that, in my opinion, there is plenty of on-street parking to support the number of units that are proposed. Okay, thank you for that information, Christina. And then finally, given the, the responses are, are fairly mixed from the surrounding area, uh, I think that the PNZ did a good thing with, with the easements. Is there anything else that, um, that staff thinks could help to mitigate the concerns raised by the residents in opposition, or is it essentially just, you know, do it or don't do it? I, I believe that's the point that we're at. I think the only other issue that I know of, and I think this has pretty much been addressed, is really about drainage. And I think that the applicant's done a good job of reaching out and working with the homeowners because the proposal with lot coverage being what it is uh, on a residential lot, you're going to have a maximum of 60% lot coverage. There have been a lot of concerns about drainage, but the site is largely covered by impervious surface today. The development of single family homes will only improve the impervious surface out there. So I think they're actually going to end up seeing an improvement in drainage in the area. Plus, it will go through a re-engineering process that will likely help the situation as well. So I think while no one likes to have construction adjacent to them and that will be a disruption, the overall uh, end product will be an improvement. Okay, well, th thank you for that. And, and uh, do we ever have stipulations in zoning that relate to how construction will take place, not just the end product that would result, but the construction process itself to mitigate impacts on surrounding areas, or is that just something that's not normally addressed in, in zoning? Um, I would say it would be unusual. I think there are, I've seen limitations in zoning, but they're, they're un very unusual. Okay. Things like uh, hours of operation and things like that, but again, it's, it's unusual. Okay, well, thank you for all of that information, Christina. I appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you, Christina. I'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to address the uh, council? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, right there, thank you. and then just. Okay. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Will Shattuck uh, with Shattuck Development Company. Uh, I guess before I wanted to get uh, get in my presentation, I wanted to congratulate Mrs. Holmer on her election, and as well as Mr. Munns on his election as mayor and re-election of Mrs. Prince. Congratulations. I know you'll serve the city well. Um, so I'm excited to be here tonight to uh, to go over our uh, proposed zoning change. Does a mouse work? Okay. 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 So Shattuck Development was founded 45 years ago by Bill and Peter Shattuck. Um, we have developed over 46 neighborhoods that consist of 85 phases, uh, generally located in North Dallas, uh, and many of them in West Plano. Uh, the next slide, there's a list of those uh, developments in West Plano. Uh, I, I'm not going to read them off, but I just wanted to uh, highlight one of them is Willoughby Polo Estates. Uh, my father, Bill, developed the surrounding uh, community probably, I think it was about 30 years ago, uh, which is another reason why I'm excited to be here tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think Christina... Uh, address the location. Uh, so I wanted to give a quick timeline on the project. Uh, in the early 90s, Shattuck Development purchased the Willow and Polo and Hunt Club from, uh, from Norman Brinker and Bob Payne and developed it into the subdivision it is today. Uh, however, uh, late uh, 2020, the Apollo Group, who's the owner of, uh, 
Glen Eagles basically shuttered the dilapidated facility and sold it to us uh, in February 2021 uh, to improve facili their facilities uh, on Park Boulevard. And I, I, think this, I think those improvements are already, have already been undertaken. Let's see. So what is the goal? Like, why are we trying to rezone this property? Uh, it's, our goal is to develop an addition to Willoughby and Polo Estates that supports a wealthy, downsizing empty nester with a new custom architecturally drawn home that has a first floor master bedroom, has high end finish outs, outdoor living, and a pool optional size rear yard. And in order to accomplish that, we need to apply PD 423 to the entire site versus um, versus uh, versus uh, like the majority of it. Uh, as Christina said, there's just like a sliver uh, of SF9, but that that impedes like the the goal of what we're trying to do. And the, like our average lot here is 6,500 feet uh, versus the uh, 5,500 square foot minimum, um, and it feels much more like. A, an SF6 or a, a single family home than a, a patio home. So um, I wanted to go over the layout just a little bit more if you had any, I guess, any questions about it. M Mrs. Prince, I'll, I, I've got uh, a rendering of the, uh, of the landscape buffer and what we propose to do with the end caps. Uh, so these, so the, like, I, I, the layout includes 19 rear entry, 50 by 125 foot lots. Uh, we think these homes will sell between a million two hundred fifty thousand dollars and a million five. With um, home sizes will be three to four, probably forty five hundred square feet. Um, this this zoning gives us an eighty seven foot deep average pad, and having that average that, having that eighty seven foot deep pad gives us the ability to put the master on the first floor, which is what the goal is here. Um, Having the rear entry homes will have a consistent landscape streetscape uh, that isn't chopped up by driveways and um, driveways and trash cans and um, and whatever else. And it'll pull pull cars off the road, so you won't have cars parked in the driveway over the sidewalks. They'll they'll except for like an occasional visitor, they'll be you know contained in the in the back of the house. Uh, we also uh, work with. Uh, the, uh, some of the adjacent homeowners on um, on landscaping the end of the blocks, which is very important, uh, as well as the side elevation of those houses, because that's really what you'll see. Uh, so today, the current streetscape uh, is basically a Fatinia line, like uh, it's Fatinia line with uh, tennis fence and has overhead lighting. Uh, on Castle Gate, you've got a tack house, uh, the filled in pools. Uh, with some iron fence. And on Old Westbury, which is the east side, you have the Fatinia lined uh, tennis fence, overhead lights, a dumpster, and a parking lot. Okay, so um, a ta uh, 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 so I've got on the presentation a uh, like a rendering of the landscape buffer. So what we're proposing is um, is to basically have a layered landscape approach, uh, iron fence, masonry columns that fit the, the, with the same materials in which the subdivision itself is constructed. So it'd just be consistent. It would just look like it's always been there, um, but really gives a, uh, gives some depth. And um, I, I, I think it'll be beautiful. Um, I mean, if the tree can, I mean, we're gonna put like, can the tree fit? That's how big a tree we're gonna put. Um, and I think uh, that'll also, there's one gentleman that, that, um, that faces, he's like, well, what am I going to look at? You know, and so I, I think this um, artistic rendering uh, gives like a visualization for, for what that uh, will, will look like. Uh, so we've done extensive HOA outreach, um, uh, starting with a call with the uh, board of directors um, in February. Uh, in April, we had a Zoom call with the residents. In May, I presented at the annual HOA meeting at Glen Eagles, uh, which was a ton of fun. And uh, and just ongoing, I've I've been I've answered every call, every email from any interested or concerned resident uh, that uh, that had a, that had a question about it. Like on the um, on the sign, I put my 
I didn't put my cell phone number, but I put my email address so that if somebody just saw it and just said, hey, how do I call these, like, how do I get all these guys? There it is. Um, so what that resulted in is a, uh, is a letter of support from the board president um, that supports our zoning case. I'm not sure if it's in your packets, uh, but uh, I gave a copy of it to Christina uh, if you'd like to see that. Uh, what does, what is, you know, our cooperation with the uh, Will of Impolo Estates result in? It results in uh, us voluntarily annexing into the Homeowners Association. That means we'll have architectural guidelines that are followed, which means we'll have qual like quality will be insured and the home and landscape maintenance will be enforced, right? So you won't have like some houses that aren't maintained and some that are well, you know, um, they can enforce that long term. And of course, everybody likes uh, some additional dues paying members. Uh, so I don't really do this, but um, in fact, I told Craig, I don't think I've ever, but like there were some, there were some questions that I had at P and Z that seemed to be consistent, right? And so I, I thought instead of just waiting to, you know, waiting to have, I, I just would address them up front. Hopefully that'll answer some of your, some of your questions you might have. Uh, so drainage, um, you know, I, I haven't calculated it, but like an, like a, an estimate might be 85% of the site has impermeable surface coverage. Uh, there's eight tennis courts, two parking lots, um, two buildings and two filled in pools. And not being an engineer, I can tell you that that's going to improve the drainage, uh, which I don't think is a huge issue. But but I think anytime it rain, you know, uh, I, I think this will uh, will improve it. And in addition, as Christina stated, uh, they'll be reviewed by the plans will be reviewed by the engineering department. Uh, the construction timeline. So if if I could, if I know the result of tonight, which uh, hopefully goes well, um, I could have it demolished tomorrow, but uh, we're, we're planning to sign the uh, demolish a facility as soon as we, we have entitlements and plan to start construction as soon as Greg uh, finishes the construction plans, uh, which I, I, I think would result in a delivery around the second quarter of 2022. And I, I think this is going to go, I think the, the home sales are going to go great. So I, I, I think we'll be hopefully out of there by the end of 2023. Uh, price points. The closest, the closest comp to this product uh, is a couple of miles outside of Plano and sells for over a million and a half dollars. Uh, you know, and um, so we had some people question like, "Well, is that a is that an appropriate price?" And I think it's an entirely appropriate price for the product we're planning to build. These are architecturally drawn custom homes, high end finish outs in the middle of uh, one of the nicest subdivisions in West Plano. Uh, I also wanted to add uh, on the, I guess on the price point side, people that, I think there's a, there's, there's a, there's a pro, there's a product that's missing in Plano and that's a, and that's a high end uh, and that's a high end product that, that somebody that's like a, a wealthy 67 year old empty nester uh, can, can buy it, right? They live in a set, like a 6,000 foot house. They would like to renovate that home, but they don't want to leave Plano and they don't want to leave their neighbors and they, or their, you know, the club they're part of. Uh, and this, I think this product uh, is the perfect product uh, for that, uh, for that buyer. Uh, off street parking. Um, I think Christina addressed it. Uh, these are bigger lots. They're all rear entry, which is going to pull the cars off the street. Uh, no house faces another house. They face side yards and uh, landscape buffers, and um, uh, I, I, I don't think it'll be utilized. Uh, one gentleman um, asked us to investigate a layout change to face lot south uh, on the southern end of this property. Uh, we went through the full exercise. Uh, 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 great, uh, Greg gave two hours of his time to this gentleman to uh, to meet and talk about it. Uh, what we the result is basically it, it degrades the pad quality of the whole subdivision if you do that, and uh, most importantly, uh, it, it 
most importantly, I guess, it, when you face those lots south and the southern end, you end up with a front entry product, right? Which then you've got five driveways, five garages, and you've got very you've got seventy foot, uh, seventy two foot deep pads, which is really a which is really more of a production home product. You've got to have a deeper pad in order to build a custom home that'll support a price a price point like this. Uh, I guess, and just to kind of finish up my presentation, I wanted to show uh, some examples of what uh, rear entry custom uh, homes look like on 50 foot lots. And uh, I guess that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Shattuck. Any questions uh, for Mr. Shattuck? Councilman Gray? Yes, sir. Mr. Shattuck, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, you actually answered a couple of my questions, but I wanted to make sure that I saw them correctly. Um, one of the concerns has been in the neighborhood is parking on the street, uh, collecting a lot of cars, increasing traffic, et cetera. Um, from what I can tell, again, these are empty nesters, so it's one or two people. Um, they, it would it be correct to assume that they probably have no more than two cars? I, I would assume that. Okay, so if you have a driveway in the back and you have a two-car garage, in products that you've seen similar to this, do you see a lot of people parking their cars on the street rather than in their driveway in the garage? I mean, I... Uh, I would anticipate people park in their garage. There's also generally like some of these houses will put a three car tandem, um, so it's like side by side with a with a tandem. I I, I think um, I think with the amount of resident with you know with generally one or two people per home, I I just don't think it's going to generate any unless there's a party, you know, any uh, much off street parking at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think there'll be occasional visitors, but I, I think, but there's, but none of these houses face another house. So you essentially have single loaded streets, um, single loaded streets in the, in the, in the busier street, Shattuck Boulevard, it's a, um, it's a 65 foot right of way. And there's, a, I mean, it's, it's big and it's wide. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, uh, I guess what I'm saying is I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the need for it. I think there's ample parking um, as, it, as it stands today. Yeah, and, and I have a tendency to agree. I would think that someone that can afford this price point of one and a quarter to one and a half million dollars probably doesn't drive like my car, which is a 2004 Jeep. Um, and so they, they probably worry a little bit more than mine um, and probably park it in a garage is what I'm assuming, which takes the cars off the street. So yes, sir. I'm trying to consider that, that the discussion of increased traffic and increased cars on the street is probably not accurate. I, I, don't, I don't believe that, that it, there will be increased traffic. Uh, but, I mean, you have to remember with the facility, I guess maybe it's, it's shuttered now. Um, but before, I mean, it was a, it was a working facility. I mean, there. Anytime there was a, you know, there was a tennis day. I mean, the whole. I, I couldn't tell you how many cars. I didn't count them, but I mean, it was it was busy, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I would think I would think nineteen empty nester homeowners would would reduce the amount of traffic in and out of the neighborhood. Hmm. The other thing that I was curious about, and I took a look at, um, again, if someone can afford a, a home at this price point. Um, they're probably affording it because they have significantly greater wealth someplace that's making the payment on the loan if they have to make a payment on the loan at all, if they're not just paying it outright. Um, so I wanted to take a look at to see how it fit from a land use standpoint with the other properties that are around this piece of property. My discovery is, is that the, the um, patio homes to the west and the patio homes to the north are appraised at around 650, 700,000. The single families on the south, the single families on the east are appraised at around 
eight, nine hundred thousand, maybe a million dollars, probably sell for a lot more than that in both cases. So what I'm seeing is is that this fits fairly well within this neighborhood from a land use standpoint and the, what you're going to be using it for um, and what the price point is on the homes. It fits within the neighborhood. I believe I believe so. I think it's going to be among the nicest homes in West Plano. So I don't think it would degrade people's property values. My my concept is, or thought is, it's going to increase people's property values. I, I believe so, yes. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem and then uh, Councilman Riccadelli. I think that personally from a homeowner standpoint that it would be better to have these homes there than a tennis court with the bright lights shining in your in your bedroom but so i think this is a good reuse of the property and so um i would make a motion to approve with the added stipulation that pnc made i second thank you go ahead oh thank you mayor i did just have a, a couple of questions so as i understand it from the materials we've received uh you can redevelop this property by right. Uh, it just wouldn't be the exact development that you're proposing to do. So uh, am I understanding correctly that, uh, th that there will be redevelopment activity uh, over the next couple of years on this track, you know, however we vote tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and the reason I ask that is I, I noted that some of the opposition was due to the uh, potential impacts of construction and, and, you know, not wanting construction in the short term, perhaps, um, you know, some, some of the opposition was due to what will end up on the ground at the end of the process, but some of the opposition was due to the process. So uh, the process is going to take place one way or the other. Yes, sir. And, and uh, uh, as far as uh, mitigating construction impacts, I assume you all have given that some some thought about how to how to mitigate impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. I mean, generally, you, you, you can't block anyone's driveway, right? So mm -hmm. um, there could be a couple of days where they have to go around um, if there may be the work on the south end, they have to go around to the other side. Um, but every, they'll all have access to their houses. And, and I think we're going to limit, uh, I mean, our goal is to get in and out as quickly as possible, mm. not to, um, not to linger on site. Uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, we, we we're going to go as expediously as possible. Very good. Um, yeah, and, 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 our, and, our, and our goal is to start a meet, like this isn't a project that, we're going to hold lots and sell them over time. You know, I, this is, you know, so they're going to have to deal with construction for mm -hmm. 10 years. This is a, uh, our, our, our goal here is to sell the lots and build houses as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, not, this isn't like for an investment or hanging on to them. Okay. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that. And then, then my last question was about open space, the removal of the, the open space requirement. Uh, am I correct in assuming that that's because this is a fairly small development you know the the not that much acreage uh, uh in play is that is that why the and, and the annexation of the hoa presumably provides access to to other open space or uh, yes. what, what was the reason for the deletion well, it's, of the open it's, space? it's smaller than five acres okay. um so there's no requirement and there's no requirement under ex the existing zoning today okay uh, uh but yes we are we are we are uh, it's our intent uh, to be annexed into Willow and Polo Estate South HOA and um, and join their association. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for that information. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shattuck. Okay. Appreciate it. Any thank speakers you, cards? There are no speakers on the side. Right. Uh, I'll close the public hearing. We do have a motion and a second. Any comments? All right. Please vote. Thank you, Rick. We got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Appreciate it.
on a dashboard and, and see trends over time within our payment network. It allows us to do long-range planning, more than we ever had before. And that's critical when you have so many people that are moving into Collin County uh, and you've got all this traffic going on, being able to plan projects sequentially so you're not having